Blacksmith of the Apocalypse By Arcuser Chapter 21 Rainy Days The new day actually greeted Seth with, rain? And not the nice kind of rain. Big heavy drops kept incessantly hammering on the roof and against the windows. When he opened the window, the rush was so heavy that it all mixed together to sound like a single overwhelming roaring. It was so intense that he could feel it resonate in his chest. The he hurriedly closed the window. Well, looks like I will stay at home today, Seth talked to himself. Originally, he was going to clean the neighborhood. Seth had wanted to scavenge for more food, while he could still expect it to be edible and clean up any undead, he might encounter. Once he was able to make a good weapon and armor Seth wanted to go out and farm zombies. It was one of the things he never understood when watching movies or reading books around a zombie apocalypse. Zombies could not grow their number, they did not procreate. So why did people keep running away and hiding out in secure locations instead of cleaning them up and be safe for sure? Anyways, since he could not leave, he would concentrate on improving his skills. Seth freed up a place in the massive living room and summoned the spirit furnace and the water barrel. It was only a 45% success rate, but successfully melting down a rebar into the furnace fetched him a sizable ingot of medium steel and a big chunk of 10% proficiency on leave 7. The stack of rebars he had collected the other day should have been more than enough to level smelting to the next stage. Seth wanted to see what new options he could get when smelting reached the next stage, and then he could make a good weapon to farm mobs and raise his class level. And that was pretty much what the following days looked for Seth. The rain never stopped, so he spent his days inside, ate, slept and kept making iron ingots. In these days he felt a strangely familiar connection between himself and the spirit flame in the furnace. He remembered snippets of the night when he fought the zombies. Seth had felt this connection back then when he manipulated the furnace and fled through the firestorm that day. It actually helped to make the furnace control a lot smoother. Until now this only happened when he leveled up the skill itself. Like this he actually had a higher success rate than the system stated. It helped a lot in the beginning, when the success rate was still low. It saved him material and brought bonus experience, since he only got less than half the EXP for a failed attempt. But later on, it did not really lower the number of ingots he had to make by much, since the proficiency he got more than halved with every level up of the skill. The ingots kept piling up on the floor beside the furnace. When he reached level 9 on the third day, he became unsure whether the stack of rebars was actually enough. However, Seth kept going. He still had the mediocre iron ingots and the jewelry. And then he would just start melting down any metal he could find in the apartments and the house. He would definitely get to the next stage. It was not just the smelting skill that was growing. The longer he sat in front of the furnace and the deeper he stared into the flames while fiddling with the controls, the clearer he felt this connection to the fire. Ding! Passive skill. Fire Affinity Leave 5 has become Leave 6. The notification pulled him out of his trance-like state and made him fail the attempt. Frustrated he caught the molten metal in a mold and threw them into the water barrel. In the evening of the third day his worries came true, the rebars were not enough to overcome this last level and reach 10. He was Leave 9 and close to 40% when his last attempt failed. Did he give up? No. Did he take a break? Yes. Seth had a doctrine if you are frustrated you should eat. He totally didn't just come up with that or something. He vanished into the kitchen and cooked up a simple but scrumptious meal. Just you wait, he thought, and what followed was the replay of what had happened at the start of his journey. Seth scoured the whole house for any and all metals and materials and collected them in large heaps, in one of the other apartments in the house. He obviously didn't want to fill his living space with all this stuff. Overall, it was the same stuff he had found at his home, just larger quantities. Unfortunately, there were no residents who hoarded large quantities of metal in their homes. Seth really hoped this was enough, the rain outside had grown stronger in the recent days, and he really didn't feel like going out there at this time. If this kept going Seth would have to worry about the first floor being flooded. Anyways, Seth got onto turning the miscellaneous scrap he had collected into neat little metal ingots he could stack like gold bars. It could have guessed it. Despite getting an upgrade and being able to make medium quality iron, or medium iron for short, from the stuff he had collected, he could barely register the proficiency bar moving after making one. The only silver lining was that there was almost no chance of failure at this point, and he could produce these a lot faster than the steel ingots. End of day 3, his smelting stagnated somewhere around leave 9, 70%, when he couldn't keep going and went back up to his home to sleep. 
thunder so loud that it made the windows rattle audibly woke Seth up from his well-deserved sleep in the middle of the night. The heavy rain outside had not become any weaker over time. No. It actually turned into a thunderstorm now. Seth tumbled to the window to look outside. Fuck, he cursed when he saw outside. The streets of Deltan were really flooded by water. The rain was an almost impenetrable curtain that kept hitting the earth and made everything look like a blur. Why did this stuff keep happening? This was almost a desert when he came, where did monsoon rain suddenly come from? Why couldn't the apocalypse pause for a moment and give him one week of peace? Was that too much to ask? As he looked at the lake's worth of water falling from the sky Seth got the hunch, that he might have to leave this place soon. Throwing several rude gestures with his middle finger at the weather, God, and the world in general, Seth turned towards what was important now. Breakfast. Followed by grinding. Since he did not know when the power grid would break down Seth had early on started eating the perishables in the fridge. With the breakfast most of them gone now, this was one worry less, if he had to leave. The rain kept going strong, when Seth left the suite to keep smelting the metals. Today was the day, smelting would definitely reach leave 10 and rank up. He was actually surprised when he entered the room two floors below his suite, where he used to smelt yesterday. When his gaze fell on the heaps of ingots he had left in the room it was the first time he realized how much material he had actually smelted. The piles of raw materials had visibly shrunk since he started, but there was still a lot. This gave him hope. Seth summoned the furnace and started his work. Within an hour he had churned out several tens of medium iron ingots, and reach 80%. Reaching 90% he actually ran out of raw materials, so he started re-smelting the mediocre iron ingots reaching 97%. He was so close. Next, he pulled out his booty. It was a sack full of precious metals he had ransacked from several buildings and also some jewelry shops. Seth had planned to try and sell these in Starta. Maybe modern workmanship could have fetched a good price? It couldn't be helped. Seth started to turn the jewelry into small ingots of silver and gold starting with those without gems. What he didn't expect, was that these precious metal ingots gave him a good amount of proficiency, despite having a high success rate from the start. Finally. After turning half of his treasure into ingots. Ding. Skill, smelting, beginner, leave 9 has become leave 10. Ding. Skill, smelting, beginner, leave 10 has become smelting, adept, leave 1. Ding. Congratulation. You have met the prerequisite to evolve one of your skills. Would you like to evolve smelting, adept, leave one into fire manipulation leave one? Y slash N. Seth's jaw dropped to the ground. He had worked so hard to rank up smelting and now he could even evolve it. He thought for a moment. He clicked yes instinctively and immediately felt the small bond he had been feeling lately become a sturdy bridge. Ding. Ability, fire manipulation leave one acquired, thanks to the synergy of smelting, Adept, Spirit Blacksmith and Fire Affinity. Ding. Congratulation. You are the first person in your zone to obtain an ability. You are granted 5 free skill points. Not only did he get a cool sounding skill, but to top it off even an achievement reward. After calming down he looked for the skill in his skill window. It had replaced smelting. Fire manipulation leave 1. Status contracted. Contracted fires, soul fire. The user can manipulate existing flames. The user can create and manipulate flames using mental strength. The user can enter a contract with specific flames to increase effectiveness. Chapter 22 Rainy Days, 2 Seth was spellbound by his new skill, despite his exhaustion. He sat down right then and there wanting to test it. Seth was enraptured by the tiny pale blue flame emerging from his fingertips, after he concentrated on fire manipulation it resembled those viral videos of people burning gas or lighter fluid on their clothes without anything happening to them. The fire was not big, but Seth could feel a certain assertiveness from the small blue flame. It moved more or less as he wished it, like a limb with a small delay. Although Seth found fire manipulation in his skill window and the description sounded like an active skill, it was called an ability. Abilities had not been part of the tutorial so Seth didn't know. Fortunately, it was not hard to find out the difference between an ability and a skill. When Seth concentrated on ability in his skill window a tool tip opened. To sum it up, the difference between an ability and a skill was that it had aspects of both an active and a passive skill so the resource consumption could fluctuate wildly. Also, it did not consume mana. While active skills consumed mana, abilities used the user's mental strength to work. 
At this point Seth did not really know what exactly it meant by mental strength, since there was no bar for it in his status. Of course, he could roughly guess that it had something to with his concentration. From what he could infer at this point abilities seemed a lot vaguer in general than skills. On the other hand, they had a greater potential or versatility. Sitting in a dark room filled with all kinds of iron ingots Seth was playing with the small blue flame, watching his jump across his fingertips like an illusionist playing with a coin. After reading many novels and playing lots of games, he had never expected it to feel like this. It was no dead ability to throw around and be cool with like in that one TV show about bending elements. The little flames felt almost like a warm little fiend. He sat there for quite a while until... Ding! Ability, Fire Manipulation Leave 1 had become Fire Manipulation Leave 2. The notification finally snapped him out of his trance. At this point he felt tired, mentally and physically fatigued. Looking outside the window nothing had changed. Seth could barely make out anything of the city. At this point he thought, that maybe he should have left the very first day it started to rain like this. But then what? He had a lot of excuses for not leaving, but in the end, he just wasn't able to decide until it had been too late. Going out in this kind of weather was pretty much suicide at this point. Seth wasn't really much into voluntary death. All he could do now was to stay here and wait it out. With this thought he went to sleep. Starta. What's with this rain? Wilton screamed as he rushed into the priest's office. The hunter had been back to patrolling the edge of the dark woods after reporting the last time. The fence had been fixed, and he was on regular duty when the rain started. It had taken him two whole days to fight his way back to start a village. The plains were slowly drowning and the water actually stood up to his waist, when he finally managed to cross the city gate. Inside the village was dry, it was shielded by a bowl-shaped force field that kept the masses of water out. Wilton had become angrier and angrier on his journey, the worse the weather and terrain got. Nobody had warned him about this. He was so upset that he was grabbing the priest's collar, lifting the rotund man off the ground. Wilton. Calm down. What happened that enraged you so much, Simon the priest of the system held onto the hunter's wrist to try and regain contact with the floor. What enraged me? What enraged me? Maybe the two days I spend waiting through the swamp outside to get here? Maybe the fact that I almost drowned and swept into the dark woods when a small rivulet swelled into a raging current in a matter of seconds? Or maybe the fact that you did not tell me about the rain beforehand? Choose one, all of them are correct, Wilton roared as he kept shaking the priest with every syllable. Wilton. Plea stoo p shai shaking me. Thanks, Simon said and adjusted his robe after being let of. We didn't expect it to come so early, okay? I would have told you to stay in town during your next report, the priest explained belatedly. The hunter sighed. He felt a lot better after whirling around the priest, the target of all his recent negative emotions, like a rag doll. So, Wilton asked. So what, Simon looked confused. Why are we here when you knew about this rain? The whole plains are flooded. If this keeps going the town will drown too. Hee <laughs> hee. The priest had a mischievous smile on his face before he sat down at his desk and pulled out the fat folder. After torrential rainfalls then can keep going for up to three weeks the plains will be flooded and form a lake. It is part of the changed climate in this world. It takes about a week for this lake to be drained away. Once it is gone, these plains will be filled with extremely fertile alluvial deposit. It will be perfect for farming crops. It just came a little early this time. I'm really sorry Wilton. So. This will still keep going for more than three weeks, Wilton looked up to the field that kept water out of the village, how high will it rise until then? Deltan. Seth woke up to the already familiar sound of rain hammering on the roof. He stretched out and went to the kitchen for breakfast. Rationing went very well. He left his suite and went to collect all the iron ingots he had made into his inventory. He did the smelting somewhere else because of the heaps of scrap he had to melt in. Now that everything was turned into neat and convenient ingots, Seth didn't want to leave his home to forge. Seth set up the complete spirit smithy in a dedicated room and stacked all the ingots to the side. The rain still held him captive, so it was time to use his consolidated resources to finally grind the blacksmith skill. Blacksmith was the main skill of his class, so it was a shame to have it lagging behind. Seth wanted to try bigger and more complex weapons. Instead of going with quantity like he did at the start, he wanted to try quality this time. He had a hunch that making a diverse array of sophisticated and demanding weapons would get him more experience in the long run. Even if he failed, he could always just re-smelt the scrap. 
Seth's method was to start off by choosing the blueprint of a weapon and get used to the process of the weapon first. Then proceed by using the free mode to make the weapon and farm experience that way. Seth wanted to start slow and chose something smaller. It was an axe head made of medium iron. He wanted to save the medium steel for a higher skill level, or maybe even for after the rank up, if possible. This time, opposite to when he was still at home, he had a lot of wood he had gathered from around the house. Stuff like bedposts and baluster made of thick wood for example. Like this he could make an item, but also save some of his metal. Seth started working and meticulously followed the instructions of the system guidance. He forged a rough axe head from a whole ingot and continued with punching a hole for the shaft. After forging it into its more refined final shape came the quenching in the water of sticks. He still had no idea what exactly changed with it become the water of sticks, but sometimes the water felt warmer and sometimes colder. Maybe it helped raising the chance of the quench succeeding? The first attempt failed as it developed a crack during the quench. It made him doubt his guess. Seth still got about 7% skill proficiency from this failed attempt. He saw this as a confirmation that new things would initially give more experience. So, making and mastering the production of various weapons was the right choice. And this was his new routine from then on. He made several axes under the guidance of the system, from forging the head to shaping the handle. Seth did this until he got the process down and managed to make an axe close to optimum parameters. Then he started over, making axes in free mode until he was good enough to get a similar result. When forging he forgot the world around him and was fully focused on his work and even subconsciously started to manipulate the flame in the forge to help his work. When Seth had mastered the axe, he had reached blacksmith, beginner, leave 9, 12%. It was already deep in the night when he was satisfied and stopped. Seth had not noticed that he had worked for two days straight, but he had a tremendous hunger and thirst. For now, he left everything where it was and satisfied his stomach's demand, before falling into a very deep and pleasant sleep. Chapter 23. Rainy Days, 3 Seth had already gotten used to the incessant sound of rain, what woke him up were his bodily needs. The call of nature needed his attention. When he wanted to jump off the bed, he instantly froze, winced, and fell back on the bed groaning. Tremendous muscle pain was surging through his sore body, and he did not want to move at all. Despite his bladder's demand, he first belatedly checked his status. Name, Seth Smith. Title, Faster Than The Thought. Level, 8. EXP, 32%. Race, Orihuma. Sex, Male. Age 23. Class, Spirit Blacksmith, Unique. Affiliation, None. Health. 937 slash 1000. Mana 180, plus 3.6. Strength 18. Dexterity 20. Agility, 20. Intelligence 13 plus 5. Will power 15. Endurance 19. Personality 9. Luck 15. Free AP, attribute points 50. Free SP, skill points 9. Defense. Physical, 104. 57 plus 50, ENDX 3. Magical 55, 30 plus 25, WILX 2. Fire resistance 100%, 50% plus 60%. Skill window. Calm reaction, passive, leave 5. Blacksmith, beginner, leave 9, 45%. Blacksmith size leave 2. Fire manipulation leave 2. Blueprint, beginner, leave 2. Weapon mastery, Beginner, leave 8, 60%. Spirit Smithy leave 2. Spirit Capture leave 2. Map leave 1. Fear Resistance leave 5. Fire Affinity leave 6. Soul Infusion leave 1. Observation leave 2. Concealment leave 2. His HP had actually decreased this much from muscle pain? Seth didn't know, that he had not eaten or drank for almost 2 days and his HP had already considerably recovered. What he noticed was that some of his attributes had increased, especially strength. At least the pain was worth it. Dexterity even hit 20. This helped Seth a lot in enduring the pain. The call of nature on the other hand knew no mercy. Seth had to force himself to stand up and drag his aching body to the bathroom. He had breakfast on the small balcony of the suite, enjoying the blurry scenery and overwhelming noise of the rain. It was quite surreal to be honest but also refreshing after spending so much time in front of the forge. As he looked down, he could barely make out the surface of the water. Wasn't this a little high? 
He doubted his yes and decided to take a look, once he could move normally again. Seth once again had to acknowledge how amazing the system was, as he felt his body slowly recover. After a good meal his muscle pain had vanished within an hour. If it had been before, he would have had to wait at least several days for the pain to go away naturally. Before he got back to the forge, he decided to take a look at the water situation. The lights in the elevator shaft would not turn on. Did they short-circuited because of the water? He climbed down the ladder of the private elevator with a flashlight between his teeth, but didn't reach the ground floor. Seth could already hear the sloshing of water and waves from up here. In the shine of the flashlight, he saw the surface of the murky mix of dirt, blood, debris, zombie parts, and trash. This was no exaggeration. He could see rotten pieces of meat and something like an elbow swimming in the water below him. The ground floor was completely flooded and the water reached the height of the first floor. Climbing closer he could also smell the fluid that was no better than sewer water. But was it worse than skull-penetrating vines in a world of twilight? Arguably not. Seth hoped that it was really just ordinary flood water. In this world, he would doubt it, when someone told him there were skull-penetrating tentacles in this water. He was ready to change his evaluation in that case. Anyways, nothing else happened, so Seth shrugged his shoulders and climbed back up. He had enough food for weeks right now and could sit it out. He would start worrying when the water actually started reaching the upper floors. Seth would not be able to reach the rest of the house without passing the water but it was a slight inconvenience at most. He had already collected the useful stuff, anyways. Seth got back to the forge and started a new blueprint. It was a parry dagger about the length of his forearm made of medium iron. He wanted to slowly get closer to swords and sabers for now. He lacked the wood to finish pole arms and similar weapons, so he had to concentrate on those mainly made from metal. Going about it the same way, he did with the axe, Seth started by following the guidance of the system. He slowly started incorporating the fire manipulation into his forging. He failed a few times, when he consciously tried using it and overheated the metal. Seth kept trying anyways and was soon rewarded. Ding! Ability, Fire Manipulation Leave 2 has become Fire Manipulation Leave 3. And not just that, soon after his blacksmith finally ranked up. Ding! Skill, Blacksmith, Beginner, Leave 9 has become Blacksmith, Beginner, Leave 10. Ding. Skill, blacksmith, beginner, leave 10 has become blacksmith, apprentice, leave 1. Ding. Skill, blueprint, beginner, leave 2 has become blueprint, apprentice, leave 2. But wait. Why was it apprentice? Was it not supposed to be adept after beginner? Hold up. Did this mean, that when the blacksmith in Starta evaluated his billhook, it was not just one rank his work had skipped, but two? Seth was stunned. Although it took hard work to develop his class, the work was actually gratifying and the class seemed even better than he had estimated at first. When he reached Adept or Master, or whatever came at the top, wouldn't he be able to create legendary weapons and armor? He also had the weapon mastery. Overwhelming gear and skill, so what if he had no flashy combat skill? When monsters would be cut like paper in front of his weapon. Seth became quite smug as he imagined plowing through his enemies with the ultimate gear. It was until his eyes fell on the pile of scrap and failed products what kind of resources would he have to burn through to get to such a level? How much sweat and blood would he have to pour into the metal and flames? Yet, yeah, let us stop thinking about the future, it s just depressing. Let us just do it one step at a time. Slow and steady wins the race, he motivated himself. He observed the successful and good weapons he had made. The pile was a lot smaller, but it showed that he just needed to work hard. Seth did not realize, that calling his progress slow and steady was a slap to the face for any regular blacksmith. Seth would not disassemble his best works, but keep them and try to sell them in Starta. With his renewed mindset Seth got back to grinding the given blueprints. It was his turn to be stunned again. His blueprints had also ranked up with his blacksmith and there were a bunch of new blueprints he could choose from. There were mostly upgraded and more elaborate versions of existing blueprints, but also some new weapons with more exotic forms like chalk rams. But not just weapons, but there were also blueprints of chainmail and more plate armor now. After testing to make a gauntlet, he decided to keep making weapons, since making armor was a lot more time intensive. Weapons were more time effective. The apprentice rank was another step up from beginner, at this point he barely got experience for the simpler things he had done until now. 
From here on his days became quite monotone as he first mastered all those blueprints he could do with medium iron, until it ran out. He kept re-smelting the scraps until all the iron was turned into acceptable weapons. He also found out, that the change of smelting to fire manipulation had almost no impact on the usage of the furnace. One of these days his fire manipulation and affinity also leveled up. Seth lost count of the day as it became a fixed routine of sleep, eat and forge, always accompanied by the constant sound of rain. With blacksmith, apprentice, leave to, 12%, he finally graduated from making weapons out of medium iron, as he had even run out of scrap. On his side lay a heap of sparkling finished weapons. Hunting knives, parry daggers, axes, several forms of maces and war hammers, short swords, arming swords, sabers, lang messer, and many reaching the optimal parameters of the blueprint. It was in this period, that Seth felt the increase in his practical skills for real. He made less and less errors while forging and started to become a lot faster, even on blueprints he was unfamiliar with. In the end, many weapons were very similar. Drops of sweat ran down his, now, well-defined body and collected all kinds of soot and grimes he was covered him. He sat in front of the forge almost naked, looking like a barbarian. He didn't remember when, but at some point, Seth stopped wearing clothes while working in the smithy. Ever since he started using fire manipulation the flames kept jumping over when he lost concentration and burned whatever he was wearing. Having lost all sense of time he used this chance to take a break. The power grid had broken down some time ago and water also stopped running in the suite, so he climbed to the roof and used the curtain of rain to flood the grime off his body. Washing his lean body, he felt his muscles bulge below his skin. Even the first beginnings of a beard were growing on his face. The cold shower woke him from his mechanical thinking and refreshed his tired mind. His only indication of time were his rations that showed a visible shrinkage. Chapter 24. New Days When Seth checked his status, he ignored his reduced HP. He knew that he wasn't very nice to his body, when he was caught in his fascination for forging. It would heal fast, as long as he took a good break. His strength and endurance reached 20 in the last days, but stopped growing there. Was this the cap? I guess this is as far as I can go with just training, eh, Seth mumbled to himself and looked at the free attribute points he had saved up until today. He was finally at the point, where he had to think about how to distribute them. He also ogled the free skill points, maybe he should decide on those too. Seth looked at his attributed for some times. As a blacksmith he obviously needed strength and dexterity. These grew the fastest when he was forging, so they were the most important. Followed by endurance and willpower. The first was obviously needed when he was supposed to work for hours without end. The second seemed to have something to do with fire manipulation, he had no idea why else it would have grown. It made sense that willpower had something to do with mental power, but it was still below 20, so it would have to wait. Intelligence was similar, it grew slowly on its own, and he had the ring. So, it didn't seem very urgent to raise it. Agility? It probably wasn't necessary for a blacksmith, but it might come in handy in a fight so he should not neglect it. Seth had 50 point to distribute. After deciding on the priority, he put 15 in street and dex each, 10 into end and 5 into AGI. Seth saved 5 for will once it reached 20 points. It wasn't like in a game, where the attributes were just numbers. With the sudden jump in power Seth could feel his muscles, not bulge, but tighten as if they became denser. He also felt a lot fitter and healthy, which was probably the effect of endurance. The effect of dexterity was a lot more subtle. His hand-eye coordination seemed to have increased. Seth's sense of touch in his hands felt more precise and the movement of his fingers became faster and smoother. He didn't know how else he would describe the effect of dex. Next were the skill points. Where should he invest them? Looking at the list of skills, not all of them could be upgraded with skill points. Somewhere locked, he could not increase spirit smithy for example, even though he had been able to before. Seth realized that some skills could not be leveled up with SP and others might have prerequisite to be leveled up. He would have to keep an eye out for this. This only left the skills blacksmith size, map, soul capture soul infusion, blueprints, observation and concealment for him to improve at the moment. It would never hurt to increase the first one, even though leave 3 cost 2 SP soul capture also seemed like a good choice. It would be a shame if he saw a good material and couldn't collect it. It, too, cost 2 SP. Now Seth was down to 5, and he didn't really want to use them up now in case Soul Smithy unlocked any time soon. 
he didn't feel like Blueprints was worth 2 SP right now. Map actually made him curious for its next stage. At the moment he could only see the places he personally mapped out. Anything else was just fog of war. And to top it off, Map Leave 2 only cost him 1 SP. After increasing its level, Seth immediately opened the map window. What he got was a black and white topographic map of the whole continent. It showed his position and the position and names of bigger cities like Omega City, or City B where he had come from. It also showed Deltan and Starta because it were places, he had visited. He could also zoom in on the small specks he had traveled himself. It worked like a navigation app on his phone. Seth could zoom in on the map and himself. The places he had been to were colored in high definition like a satellite image. Anything else became a dark blur when he zoomed in on it. Seth appreciated these new functionalities but what was even more interesting was a button that had appeared in the corner. It was called Auto Map. When he pressed it, it looked like a radar appeared around his position on the map. After one rotation a big circle with a radius of maybe 150 meters had been mapped out at his position and the Auto Map went on a one-minute cool down. Now he could see his building and the neighboring ones as clear as day from a top view. Not only that. It was a real-time image. He could see that the flood had almost reached up to the third floor without having to climb down the elevator shaft. The water was already halfway up to him. He looked out the window and the rain was still going strong. How long was it going to rain like that? Would he really have to leave here again? Don't forget, step by step. No use in worrying, he shook his head and motivated himself. If he had to leave, he would have to leave, he could not change that. What he could do was clear, keep grinding. It was finally time to start making things with steel. He was hyped. The moment he entered the smithy and lifted his hammer he could feel the effect of increased strength even more pronounced. The previously hefty hammer was light as a feather. And his dexterity allowed him to control its movement with utmost precision and ease. He first tried the same parrying dagger he mastered in the very beginning. His production speed had increased tremendously, and he finished it in a fracture of the time he needed before. Seth easily hit the optimum parameters, too. It gave him almost 5%. It was a huge chunk compared to what he had gotten for the things made of medium iron he had done until recently. The quality gap to steel was easily discernible at this point. Unlike how he had planned it, he now had no unending supply of medium quality steel, as he could not leave the building. Seth didn't know how much further the steel could get him, so it was time to decide on the gear he wanted to make for himself. It was really a day of decisions. Seth chose one of the blueprints that were added after the rank up. It s was the improved version of a longsword. It had an elegant sleek blade of 90 centimeters length, a handle he could either grab with one or two hands and a simple cross guard. It looked traditional and unassuming. The damage it had with optimal parameters on the other hand was everything but unassuming. Superior longsword. Common uncommon. Damage, 70 to 230. Durability 900. As the culmination of blacksmith knowledge this weapon can transcend material confinement and reach the rank of uncommon without using uncommon materials, if the workmanship is up to par. The following weeks were filled with anguish and failure as Seth not only trained his skill, but worked hard on the gear he planned to wear in the future. And when the sun finally shined again above Deltan, Seth was ready to greet the new days before him. Ding! Title, Shut and Gained you have stayed indoors for several weeks without interacting with people and didn't feel lonely at all. Shut in grants plus one on all stats in closed spaces you stayed in for more than 2 4 H. Black lines covered his face as the system ruined his moment. Chapter 25. Final Preparations Seth stood on the roof of his current base and looked down on the water surface that had almost each his floor. It had rained for a long time and now the morning sun's rays were sparkling on the waves of the big lake that had swallowed the city. The weather had calmed down a lot. After raining for so long, the murky water had turned clear and looked almost clean. Seth could almost see the streets below on the bottom of the lake. The streets he had walked just a few weeks ago had turned into an underwater world. It was quite fascinating in a sense. And it was quite troubling in every other sense. At this time Seth's rations started dwindling and he finally ran out of raw materials to grind his skill. Of course, he had long prepared for this time when he had to leave. The food he had left were mostly preserved stuff and could easily fit into a few of his item slots. After the water supply unexpectedly stopped working, he had stocked up on it using the rain. It was also called clean water and stacked with the regular tap water, so he did not worry. 
Now six of his sixteen item slots were filled with food and water and the rest held stacks of finished weapons, he planned to sell, miscellaneous stuff and his gear. Seth also had another reason to leave now. It was when he got ready to make himself a bow for long-range attacks, when he finally realized, that he actually lacked something important. After mastering the blueprint to make a steel bow he remembered the vine he had picked up all this time ago. It was an uncommon material he could not identify at the time and subsequently forgot about. Seth remembered it, because bows are usually made of wood, right? So, he had dug it up from the pile he had deposited the very first day he arrived in the suite. Hanging trees vine, crafting material, uncommon. A hunter vine of the field boss hanging tree which is used to hunt food and absorb nutrients. Depending in the treatment, it can be more flexible and sturdier than most metals. It was the moment the hanging tree's vine entered his material catalog that several new blueprints and variations of the basic ones using the hanging tree's vine as material were unlocked. All of them had the possible rating of uncommon, only depending on the one uncommon ingredient. Seth chose the blueprint of a composite bow as he could split the vine and gain several tries like this. Even so he was not too familiar with the treatment of the wood, he managed to successfully make two complete bows. While the ordinary medium steel products barely got him any proficiency past leave 5, these bows gave him almost 10% proficiency with their uncommon rating, despite being far from perfect. This was something he had already experienced with the longsword and it obviously made sense. The rating and performance of the product he made had a big influence on the proficiency he gained. But it was a lot easier to get an uncommon rating, when using uncommon materials. Even when they didn't come out perfectly. This made Seth realize, that sitting around and grinding the blueprints over and over with the same material was not the best way to improve anymore. He had to enlarge his material catalog. He needed to collect experience with many and most importantly better materials to keep improving. Seth had been eager to keep going at that time, but he left one set of materials behind. He did the same for a few sets of material of the longsword. The reason was simple. He wanted to increase his capabilities for the last attempt, so he could leave with the best weapons possible and make them on the day before he left. Now was the time. Seth had reached blacksmith, apprentice, leave seven and was sure that these two weapons would probably accompany him for quite some time now. This made it also the time to test the one skill he had held back on until now, soul infusion. He just had two little materials to mess around with this skill. At the moment he had seven souls in total. Two of them were the uncommon ones from his quest, the others had dropped from goblins and kobolds he had killed. Before he made the final products with the two uncommon souls, he wanted to test soul infusion and made two long swords. Seth suddenly understood that fire manipulation was not his first ability. Soul infusion worked in the same way. During the forging he could touch and coax the immaterial form of the souls to follow his instructions. The soul behaved similar to metal. Seth had to fold the steel and knead the soul into the material, to evenly spread it throughout the whole blade. When he quenched the blade, he could feel the barrel's water having a huge effect on the soul. He had no specific skill for it, but he had confirmed that the temperature of the water changed depending on the piece that was quenched. Now it was almost soul-chilling cold. With the cooling of the metal, the soul was contained and bound. The weapon became its new body. There might be a huge chance of the soul breaking away from the workpiece, if he used something other than this water to quench. After he finished fitting the crossguard, Handle and pummel the sword brought him 2% proficiency. It was his first time and he was unfamiliar with this process, so Seth understandably made some mistakes. Still, the weapon came out as uncommon. Superior longsword. Uncommon. Damage, 190. Durability 1100. A good weapon made by an aspiring blacksmith. Despite minor deficiencies of the workmanship, this weapon shows a slightly improved performance owing to special treatment. It lacked some attack power, but the durability outperformed the original blueprint. The skill also mentioned magic conductivity. Seth had tried pushing mana into the weapons before, but he felt a high resistance from normal steel weapons and their durability started dropping at a visible speed. The magic power was like electricity in a tungsten wire. The resistance and the energy loss were very high, to see any kind of effect. When he tried it on his test longsword it felt a lot smoother than normal steel and it easily formed a thin pale layer of light on the weapon. Conducting magic into a sword increased its damage, that was all Seth could conclude at the moment. After another two attempts with the small soul Seth felt ready to go for the final product using the medium-sized soul of the orc. He had gotten accustomed to the feeling of a souls in his hand. The only difference to the small souls was the size of this one. 
he had to fold and work the steel more often to steadily infuse it into the material. Ding! Skill, soul infusion leave 1 has become soul infusion leave 2. When he finally quenched the blade, his soul infusion actually leveled up. Seth was very satisfied with the result, after finishing the sword. Superior longsword. Uncommon. Damage, 254. Durability 1500. 1 grants 1.5x damage against enemies with less STR. An excellent weapon made by an aspiring blacksmith. The experienced workmanship tells of great talent. This weapon shows greatly improved performance owing to special treatment. This time the longsword even had a supernatural ability similar to the ring. No wonder it was described as primitive enchantment. Dealing more damage against weaker opponents really sounded like something that fit an orc's souls. After seeing what the uncommon soul did for the sword, Seth was excited about what it could do for the bow. What effect would a vengeful soul bring forth? Maybe a curse? He soon stopped dreaming and became serious again. Working on the bow cost him utmost concentration. Seth had no way of practicing this, it was his only chance. His worries were unfounded. It came to light, that infusing a soul into an organic material like wood, was a lot easier than spreading it in metal. The only difficulty was the composite part of the bow. It was not possible to split the soul, he had to pull and stretch it to infuse it into the metal part while assimilating into the wood at the same time. This cost him a lot of concentration, but he was able to manage thanks to all the training he had with fire manipulation. The composite bow he made as a result was truly breathtaking. The bows he made before looked similar to a modern recurve bow, but reversed. The limbs were made of the almost black vine wood while the grip was a dark steel gray giving it an elegant monochrome color scheme. But this one had a crimson red glint to it giving it an underlying impression of malice. Vengeful Hunter Bow Unique Damage, 150 Durability 1000 One arrow's shot with this bow show malice and will correct their trajectory slightly to hit vital points. Two inflicted wounds will hurt more, heal worse, and have a high chance to get infected. A frightening weapon made by an aspiring blacksmith. A bow possessed by a malicious will to hurt its benefactor's enemies. Usage condition, Seth Smith. His jaw almost touched the ground, when Seth read the description. Then he broke out into a victory dance. With such an awesome bow he felt almost happy to leave soon. One was assured, he was ready. Chapter 26 Leaving Home, Again Seth felt a lot better about leaving his home this time compared to his first. He had the two best weapons he could possibly make in a light set of dark grey plate armor and black canvas that gave him some protection, but did not get in the way of his movement. All of it was snugly stowed away in his inventory together with all his rations, useful stuff, and other works. Wearing a set of clean clothes, he had found in the house, he stepped out on the balcony leaving the empty suite, that had been his home for a few weeks, behind him. The glistening water surface was barely two meters below his feet. Yes, he would have to swim. It was the only option now. He had observed the water for some time now and could not see any skull-penetrating tentacles in the water, or any other life to speak of. Of course, he did not plan to swim all the way to Starta. He hoped that he could find some floating debris and driftwood to build a raft he could use to sail back to Starta. Seth was pretty sure that big old man with his big old folder had a counter plan for the flood, or else Starta would be gone. And if Starta really was not there anymore, well he could just keep sailing. He knew that the plains and the land in the west rose higher than Deltan, there was definitely dry land there. The water could not have covered the whole continent, right? Here goes nothing, he said and jumped down into the water holding his breath. The water was warmer than he had expected, pleasant even. Well, this was about to become a desert and it was quite warm here. As he dove into the water it was so clear that he could make out the blurry outlines of the streets below. The streets had become a world tinted in an azure hue. When he resurfaced, he gasped for air. No matter what one may say about the apocalypse, it created really spectacular scenes. At least for him. After reorienting himself with the map, Seth started swimming along the deep water channels bordered by the house fronts and rooftops of the sunken city. The sun stood high in the sky as he set off. Seth was looking for floating debris and driftwood he could use to make a raft. He had more than enough rope and even had made some space in his inventory in case he found something big. After some time, he had already collected a few floating items he judged usable like the empty bottles of water dispensers and some wooden pallets that had probably drifted out from one of the stores in the vicinity. He was able to put those in his inventory. He was swimming down a wide main street, 
pulling a mix of miscellaneous other stuff behind him, until a disturbing sight disrupted the young man's shopping spree. They were here. It was the shadow of a giant tentacle in the depths of the water, slithering down the main street towards his location. Seth panicked for a short moment and then became really calm. Maybe it had not noticed him yet? If he moved really slow and didn't disturb the water, he might blend in with the floating litter around him. Maybe he could reach the shallow water on one of the flooded rooftops to the side like this. TV had taught him that this worked with crocodiles and things like that. So, he started to close in on the side of the road towards the edge of a rooftop as the shadow below kept getting closer and closer to his position. Ding! Passive skill, fear resistance has become leave six. Keeping his eyes on the growing shadow he fumbled for the edge of the roof behind his back. When he finally reached it, Seth pulled himself into the shallow water on the rooftop, away from the wet abyss that was the street behind him. Here he could stand up and the water barely reached his knees. Solid ground below his feet helped tremendously to calm his heart. Letting go off the rope he had used to keep the litter with him, he stepped closer to the edge again, to see what the shadow was doing. It came closer to the surface and in the clearer water Seth could finally see what it was. A giant tentacle with two eyes. A snake. Standing on the edge of the building, his figure was minuscule compared to the gigantic snake that was passing him in the water below. The beast was longer than the building he stood on and it felt like an eternity as he waited for it to completely pass by. Seth was horrified. This encounter easily topped his run-in with that demonic griffin. This thing could probably eat those for breakfast. Just standing there and watching this titan pass him like that got him closer to realizing his own mortality than even the hanging tree had. This was just way too close. And then when the tip of its tail finally left his range of sight. Ding. You have witnessed the terror of field boss Titanoboa Matriarch. Experience gained. His heart stood still. This thing was a field boss, too. How could this have happened? Why did he keep meeting field bosses? What Seth did not know was, that it was not uncommon to meet a field boss, as they were just creatures declared as such by being the strongest in the region by a certain margin. Not necessary all of them were genuine big shots like the hanging tree. It took Seth some time to calm down, as he sat there in the shallow water on the rooftop. He checked the supplies he had collected and decided, that it was probably enough to build a simple raft and get out of this place. Meeting a monster like that when he was swimming in the water was a death sentence. Not that sitting on a nutshell was better but it helped mentally. The silver lining was that the field boss swam into the direction of the central plaza, the opposite of where he was headed. It took several hours to build the raft. Seth even melted some of the medium iron weapons to make nails for the raft. Quite good, if I may say so myself, he remarked proudly, looking his raft that was bobbing up and down in the shallow water. The platform of the raft was made with pallets, he had connected with nails and other driftwood. He was sure of its sturdiness. The platform had the empty water dispenser bottles in the corners and all kinds of other floating rubbish like pieces styrofoam isolation strapped below it to give it more buoyancy. It had a mast and a blue-white striped sail formerly known as a curtain rail and a shower curtain. They were borrowed from one of the rooms below his feet. It was a short diving adventure, he did not want to repeat. The thought of the flooded building, the darkness, and chaos inside, filled with floating remnants of their previous owners, made him shiver. Anyways, his work looked very... Majestic. Yes. Well, at least it floated well. When Seth entered it, it barely lowered in the water. The boss was an indication for him, that the water was most likely not as safe as it looked. Even so he had not seen anything down there. It would not have been a surprise. With the raft he fortunately did not need to swim from this point on, so he decided to wear his armor and sword, too. Just in case something attacked his vessel. For this he used a function of the inventory he recently discovered. It had probably been added when he reached leave 5 and made wearing his gear a lot easier. Auto equip. A typical function in a game. Seth did not have to laboriously put on his armor like in medieval times, but it was automatically worn when he pulled it into the equipment slots. Gauntlets, pauldrons, greaves, surcoat, he pulled everything to the equipment slots, and they appeared snugly fitting on his body. Soon the wet clothes he had worn were replaced by a complete set of armor. It was a mix of plate armor such as the gauntlets and cloth armor beneath it made of the black cloth from the tents he had looted at the plaza. Except for the cloth that actually gave the armor a slight magic resistance, there was nothing special about it except the quality. And it looked quite good, for Seth's taste. I shall become the king of pirates, he joked around as he entered his new vessel and started his journey.
Like this Seth set off and used auto map to find a way using the smaller streets and alleys to get out. Our newbie sailor really did not want to meet a massive enemy like the boa when sitting on his little nutshell. Chapter 27 Snake Pit Seth sat cross-legged on his rinky-dink little nutshell and had nothing to do. He had been on edge and observing the water for the first hour of his journey. The encounter with the field boss left him nervous. But nothing happened. Nothing attacked, nothing appeared. No wormholes opened and threw enemies at the battle-ready adventurer. He slowly started to relax again. Now Seth just sat on his raft and kept staring at the map and using auto map from time to time to get a better image of his surroundings. His boredom was only interrupted by the occasional need to paddle his raft back on course or into a new alley to avoid the big channels of water. Seth used the time to think about his skills. Map had gotten auto map on leave 2 and he kept pondering about whether it would become more game like if he leveled it more. It would really help in this situation if the map could show enemies. Or maybe a real time image. Then he could at least see if something big was closing in on him. But was it worth it? LV3 cost 2 skill points. He only had 4 SP left and he definitely wanted to hold 2 back in case Spirit Smithy unlocks soon. Was map really worth the gamble? As he was pondering, he heard the splashing of water to the side. Before he could even jump to his feet something heavy crashed into him and pinned him to the ground. A big serpent with its maws wide open had latched onto his forearm he had instinctively brought up. Otherwise, it would have been his neck. Even so its teeth could not penetrate the gauntlet steel plate covering his forearm, it vehemently bit down on his arm. That was until the other gauntlet came to the rescue and rammed into its face. Again, and again the armored fist smashed into the snake's head until it became a bloody mess and finally let go. Once Seth came to his senses weapon mastery had kicked in. Do not underestimate armor. Utilizing armor for offense and defense was also part of weapon mastery. No matter what melee attack you do, doing it while covered with a steel plate hurt more. After the several meters long constrictor looking snake had lost its life, or at least its consciousness, Seth jumped to his feet and got ready. He unsheathed his sword and observed the now calm water surface in a battle-ready stance. He squinted when remembered the kill notifications and stabbed the snake lying on his raft. Ding! You have killed baby Titanobo leave 7 you have earned experience. As if it had waited for the chance, there was another splash behind him. His bait worked. Turning around in a fluid motion he swung the longsword. The snake that had just shot out of the water was cleanly cut in midair. One bloody half sunk back into the water while the one with the head, still squirming, fell on his raft. Just as he lifted his foot to stomp this one's head, another boa broke through the water surface and aiming at his lightly armored knee pit. The teeth penetrated the thick black cloth and sunk into his flesh. Arg! Seth screamed in surprise. Pain shot through his body and paralyzed him for a moment as he lost balance. This was the first time he was injured since he started his adventure in the apocalypse. They saw him kneel and decided to pile on him. Another snake jumped out from the left, aiming for his neck again, but was also blocked by his gauntlet. One more came from the right, but met the hastily swung sword before reaching him. He was in danger and the adrenaline kicked in. Seth did not panic now, he was angry. Angry at himself that he had given in to such little pain. That he had lost his calm for something so trivial. And angry at these little fuckers that tried to ambush him. He smashed his left fist on the ground in anger and pulled himself together. At the same time, he had smashed the still squirming snake head, ending its suffering. Using this moment two more snakes appeared from the water, aiming for his head. How many were there? Incensed, Seth ignored the pain in his leg. In one movement he straightened himself and used the momentum to pull up his sword. Both snakes were cut with an upward diagonal slash. Ding! Skill, weapon mastery, beginner, leave 8 has become leave 9. Seth had no time to listen to the system's notification. Next, he crushed the head of the snake biting down on his gauntlet with the pommel of his sword and proceeded to cut away the body of the snake that desperately tried to curl up his leg. The feeling of vanishing pressure on his wounded knee as it died was a joy. His mind was calm now, almost cold. But his heart was still burning with wrath and blood lust. Ding! You have leveled up. You are now leave 9. He got into stance and vigilantly scanned his surroundings. There was no more splashing and he could make out no movement in the water. Did he scare them off? Seth looked at his poor little raft, that was drenched in blood and littered with snake parts. The raft left a trail of blood in the water behind him. He could guess, had this wasn't good. Fortunately, his armor and weapons worked. 
These snakes were all leave 7 or leave 8 but the long sword had cut through them as if they were not there. Still, he would prefer to avoid such a fight where he was surrounded on water teeming with the bodies of snakes. It was quite the frightening thought. He had to get away, fast. Looking at the map to find a way, he suddenly remembered his pondering from earlier. Maybe map LV.3 was worth a shot. Oh, pretty please give me an enemy radar. Or life detection is okay, too. Oh, pretty please with sprinkles on top, Seth prayed to Nchis as he pumped 2 SP into map. Chuckle ding. Skill, map leave 2 has become special leave 3. Special, when Seth checked there was a new button. It was pink with colorful sprinkles and red life detection radar. Dave Fugue. This time Seth was sure, the system had answered him. And it made fun of him. But Seth was okay with that, when he saw that the life detection radar or LDR in short worked. It worked just like a radar. A bar of light moved like the hand of a clock with him in the center and made little blips that showed signs of life for a short time. Its range was a radius of 150m around him, just like the auto map. There was a countdown of one hour displayed in the corner of the map window, so that was probably the duration of the skill. With this an auto map he would easily find a safe way out of the blip. 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 Oh, no. A cloud of blips appeared all around him on the map. Not just in the channels, they were in the buildings, too. And they were closing in on him. He facepalmed hard, Titanoboa Matriarch. Seth was paddling through a giant snake nest. Seth was given a totally overpowered skill in his time of need. He could see all enemies in a radius of 150m. And it helped him not one bit. He was already completely surrounded and there was no way to break out of the encirclement. To make things worse, it would be become dark soon. Chapter 28 A Horrible Night Seth took a deep breath. Panic would not help him in this situation. The rhythmic throbbing of his mangled knee pit did not help to keep a clear head, so he ripped off stripes from the black cloth in his inventory to apply a makeshift pressure bandage. Once done Seth looked around and came to the conclusion, that escape was not an option. With his leg like this, it was a bad idea to fight on this nutshell. Close to the outskirts of Deltan were few buildings with dry floors above water, but there were still some in the vicinity. Seth would make a last stand at a higher floor and see if he could sit this one out. Maybe he could hide. He forgot worrying about the splashing and making noise and paddled towards the closest building as fast as he could. It had three floors above water level, that should be enough to get an advantage over the snakes. With groaning and grunting Seth climbed through a broken window into the next dry floor of the building. His knee kept hurting more and more. He had realized that with all his preparations, he had never thought of medicine. He did not even have a first aid kit with him. The room he entered looked like a meeting room, with a few tables building a big one and lots of chairs surrounding it. With some rope he tied the raft to a radiator right below the window and stumbled out of the meeting room. Time was of essence. He came into an expansive room with a lot of messy and collapsed cubicles. This must have been a big office building before. Office, office, toilet. Ah. The staircase, he mumbled as his eyes frantically scanned the floor and checked the doors. Once the right door was found, he rushed up the staircase like a drunken madman. Seth kept faltering with every step as blood drenched his pant leg. The next floor looked the same as the last one, a big office space. The high number of generic desks actually gave him an idea. Despite the pain, Seth went back down and started with the staircase connecting to the water. With his 35 STR he could easily lift the furniture and started throwing the down the staircase. Like this he blocked the way up from the water in a short time. Now a huge mess broken furniture and cubicle walls filled the stairs below. That was not all. He went back up to the next floor and did the same. Now he had two barriers between himself and his pursuers. This should buy him some time. He would make his last stand on the top floor. After he blocked off the way down, he went up to see what the highest floor looked like. Ah, the management floor, he mumbled once he saw the few big offices with luxurious looking features. The desks here were made of fine wood and there would have been a pleasant view over the city, before it was hit by an earthquake, became a wasteland, and subsequently flooded. His eyes opened wide as he looked out the window saw the dark water squirming with bodies in the last light of dusk. He was so boned. There was no way could fight that many mobs. Hat. It's not like he had a choice, right? Only after he barricaded the door to the staircase with those heavy office desks, 
Did he take the time to examine his wound and check his status? Name, Seth Smith. Status, bleeding, minus 10 HP slash minute. Title, faster than the thought. Level, 9. EXP, 8%. Race, Orihuma. Sex, male. Age 23. Class, spirit blacksmith, unique. Affiliation, none. Health, 705 slash 1000. Mana 190, plus 3 comma 8. Strength 35. Dexterity 35. Agility, 25. Intelligence 14 plus 5. Will power 25. Endurance 30. Personality 10. Luck 15. Free AP, attribute points 9. Free SP, skill points 3. Defense. Physical, 220, 90 plus 50 plus 80, ENDX 3. Magical, 90. 50 plus 25 plus 15, WILX2. Fire resistance 100%, 50% plus 70%. Skill window. Calm reaction, passive, leave 5. Blacksmith, apprentice, leave 7, 40%. Blacksmith size leave 3. Fire manipulation leave 4. Blueprint, apprentice, leave 2. Weapon mastery, beginner, leave 9, 23%. Spirit Smithy leave 2. Spirit Capture leave 3. Map leave 3. Fear Resistance leave 6. Fire Affinity leave 7. Soul Infusion leave 2. Observation leave 2. Concealment leave 2. He sat down with his back leaning against the wall and unequipped the greaves. The makeshift bandage was oozing blood. The pants were ripped, just like his flesh and it bled a lot. When he revealed the wound, it was barely visible with all this blood. But judging from the status it may have looked worse than it was. Still, no need to take a risk. Seth cried out as he used the liquor, he had found in the desks, to wash away the blood and disinfect the wound. This was definitely the least exciting part of the evening, yet. The wound that came to light looked very unappetizing. As they say, everything s fun and jiggles until somebody gets hurts. Especially when the one hurt is oneself. The worst thing was that even after demolishing two floors, he had not found any medical supplies. Not even an aspirin. Only the management floor was helpful. Always ask for the manager, Seth joked as he used an expensive brand belt to properly tie off his leg. He had gotten it from a spare outfit in one of the offices. And now he ripped a beautiful and awfully expensive shirt into stripes to make a very expensive bandage out of it. The bleeding status vanished for the moment after he was done with the treatment. On the other hand, his HP also refused to recover. As much as the system resemble a game, he guessed that without some awesome skill like auto HP recovery, he was stuck with his body's personal lame self recovery. Seth felt really tired now. As he sat there on the ground, leaning against the wall, his eyelids became very heavy. The sun had sunken and the world had become dark, he almost fell asleep. But Seth forced himself to stay awake. Maybe concealment could help him in this situation? He had not used it in over three weeks but he remembered while checking his status. He activated it and drowsily looked at the map. There were still a little more than 30 minutes left on the counter as he focused his attention on the movements of the little blips. Nothing changed. So, they were not tracking his presence. A bunch were already stacking in a heap at his location. Were the barricades working? Maybe they didn't find the way up. He closed the map and stared into the distance. He felt so tired. As Seth's eyes wandered over his blood on the ground of course. The blood. They must be following his blood trail. I should have stopped the bleeding a lot earlier, he reprimanded himself listlessly. Maybe, he thought, maybe I could evade them if I can get on the rooftop, from here. With this thought his eyes finally fell shut. Fatigue and blood loss took a toll on him. Wumph. Seth awoke with a start. How long had he slept? Wumph. Dayfugue. Seth shouted as the tremendous jolt once again passed through the whole building. He checked the map, but the time had run out. The radar was now on a 2-0-H cool down. He jumped up and almost sat back down when his knee screamed in pain. He stumbled towards the window, as another jolt came from that side of the building. His heart started racing in panic. What he saw was the light of the moon and stars sparkling on the body of a massive snake. It's, almost 1-0-M long tail was winding and splashing as it tried to shove its body into the floor right below the water surface. 
Where did this come from? Had it rammed into the barricade on the staircase? It was not as big as the field boss he had seen, but the size made it clearly visible. Seth used the chance to try another skill he used rarely. Observation, he concentrated mana into his eyes and looked at the giant body below him. Tidanobo Juvenile Leave 17. Name, none. Status, enraged. Skill, plus number number plus. You gotta be shitting me, Seth called out. It's not even an adult. Enraged? Don T tell me they all got triggered because I killed some of their kind. Wumph. Another impact. No, no, no. I won't have that. None of it. Even if he hit on the roof, he would be done for if that thing came up here. Seth took out his vengeful hunter bow and a stack of arrows. He did not plan to take this lying down. I am not having you come up here, big boy, he mumbled. He smashed the window plane with a mace and started spamming arrows at the exposed part of the giant snake. When the first arrows struck, he could see a health bar appear on its body. The arrows easily penetrated the scales and the snake shrieked in pain. It wriggled harder, but it seemed to be stuck in the building. Ding! Critical hit. Thanks to the effect of vengeful hunter bow you have hit target's right kidney. The snake writhed in pain. Seth smiled and kept peppering it with arrows. Ding! Critical hit. Thanks to the effect of vengeful hunter bow you have hit target's right kidney. Ding. Skill, weapon mastery, beginner, leave 9 has become leave 10. Ding. Skill, weapon mastery, beginner, leave 10 has become weapon mastery, adept, leave 1. And finally, weapon mastery also had ranked up. Not only did the arrows a little more damage now, but the health bar had started to decrease on its own. Checking the status. The snake was now enraged and bleeding. Ding. Critical hit. Thanks to the effect of vengeful hunter bow you have hit target's gallbladder. Seth could not help doing a fist pump at this shot. Unfortunately, this was also his last one. Not because of the arrows, but because the snake had managed to get unstuck and fled into the building. There was nothing he could do anymore. His only hope was that it would bleed out on the way up. Great. I am trapped in a house. Surrounded by snakes, and one the size of the basilisk from Perry Lauder is opening up the path to feast on my sorry ass. Chapter 29 Like a viper. One thing was clear. Seth had to move from this floor or... Wumph. The snake had already reached the next floor. Seth had thoroughly blocked the door to the staircase and he would definitely not unblock it to take the stairs to the roof. He needed to find another way. Climbing probably. Oh, what a joy. Climbing up the front of building, with an injured leg, three floors above a snake-infested ocean of doom. Yay, he mumbled. But how should he get up there? He did not have the time to just make a grappling hook from scratch, as he had no raw materials. He was about to use his fire manipulation to improvise a grappling hook from the weapons in his inventory when his eyes fell onto an office chair. Or its base, to be more specific. Haha, <laughs> let us hurry, with that he grabbed the cross-shaped base of the office chair. This was almost a ready-made grappling hook. A torturous headache was building up in his head as he used fire manipulation to cover his hands in flame and melt through the gas spring to get rid of the seat part. Next, Seth heated the limbs of the base and bent them the opposite way, into proper hooks with his bare hands. Ding! Ability, Fire Manipulation Leave 4 has become Fire Manipulation Leave 5. It felt as if his head was about to split when he used his pinky to poke a hold for the rope into the almost liquid handle of his new makeshift grappling hook. When the flame finally shriveled up it was as if all warmth had left his body. He summoned the water barrel and dunked the hook in, before collapsing beside it. Just a short break, he felt so cold and empty. So, this was the backlash of overusing an ability. Wumph. Crash. That sounded like his second barrier was gone. Seth fumbled for the hook in the ice-cold water and ended up toppling the barrel, getting drenched in cold water. He felt so weak. With heavy breathing he picked himself up and stumbled towards the broken window. Shaking, freezing hands threaded the rope through hole on the hook. Oh, please. Wumph. Shit, he cursed. This crash came from right behind the door. This has to work. Seth had never thrown a grappling hook. He had a little experience in climbing, but never needed something like this. He could only do what he had seen on TV. He swung it in circles to gain momentum and let it fly over the edge of the rooftop. Now he had rope it back in and hope, 
that the hooks caught the edge. Tink. Oh. The tink of hope. The glimmer of hope grew, when he pulled on the rope it didn't come loose. Wumph. The desks at the door shook. Seth stored away his gear to lose weight and wound the rope around himself. He gripped tightly and jumped out the window. For a moment he dangled above the abyss, then he smashed into the wall and almost lost grip. This would have hurt less with his armor. He was cold and his leg hurt like hell. Still, he started inching up the rope. He had to reach the rooftop. Damned snakes, stupid. You will regret this, if this was not fricking water world, I would burn you all to crisp, with each step he kept cursing the snakes that had gotten him into this situation. It did not make sense, but it gave him strength. Each burst of anger gave him a little bit of power to go on. When his numb fingers finally reached the roof edge. Wumph. The juvenile Titanoboa had broken his last defenses and entered the management floor. Seth, on the other hand, just pulled himself over the roof edge and flopped onto the roof. All tension in his body was gone and he was completely exhausted. As he laid there and listened, he could hear the giant body slithering on the floor below him. A sound unlike anything he ever heard. He could hear it nearing the window he jumped out from. Was it finally over? Seth clung to roof edge to hide behind it and closed his eyes. He instinctively used concealment waiting for the inevitable. Crunch. The shattering of glass. Seth trembled from the cold and fear. Ding. Passive skill, fear resistance has become leave seven. He jerked from the sound of the system notification. This did not help at all. Silence. Above him towered a head as bigger than himself, attached to a tree trunk of a neck that led to somewhere beyond the roof's edge. It was right above him as it swung its head left and right, scanning the roof. Seth shivered, his leg hurt, twitched, and his eyelids flickered, but his eyes were focused. Focused on that soft delectable underbelly. At no point did it leave his sight as his body tensed like a coiled spring and exploded into motion. A mighty jump brought him high in the air. His sword appeared in his hand and he stabbed at the snake's lower jaw. Before the snake could even react, the sword easily penetrated skin and skull, lodging deep into its brain. Ding. 2x sneak attack damage. Ding. Critical hit. You have damaged target's brain. Ding. Skill, weapon mastery, adept, leave 1 has become weapon mastery, adept, leave 2. Ding. Skill, calm reaction, passive. Leave 5 has become calm reaction, passive, leave 6. Relief washed over him when he saw the titan's health bar empty out. A burning ball of light, the size of a basketball emerged from its head. Ding. You have killed juvenile Titanobo leave 17 you have earned experience. Ding. You have killed an opponent more than 5 levels higher than yourself. Only 0,24% of the players have achieved this. All attributes plus 2. Ding. Title, Giant Slayer Gained. You have killed an opponent tremendously larger than yourself. Plus 20% damage increase against large opponents. Ding. You have leveled up. You are now leave 10. Ding. Inventory has been extended. Ding. New class skill has been unlocked. Check your skill window. Ding. You have completed the quest the next level you have earned new system rights. Ding. Title. Survivor gained. You are the 8th who has completed the quest the next level. End plus 5. Ding. You have received follow-up quest the next level 2. Ding. You have leveled up. You are now leave 11. Ding. You have leveled up. You are now leave 12. The system kept ringing in his ears, as Seth desperately tried to get out from under the giant snake's corpse. It had collapsed in the moment of his death and almost managed to crush him to death. Tired and panting he crawled away from under the enormous head and gave it a petty kick. Hat. Who s the vicious serpent now, at, he wanted to laugh, but only a pathetic coughing left his throat. With his last bit of energy, he collected the soul and he lost consciousness. Bright sunshine fell onto him. He grunted as he unwillingly opened his eyes. It was morning. He had a disgusting taste in his mouth. Squinting hard he oriented himself on the rooftop. Rumble. What was that? Seth hurried to stand up. It was not the boa, the snake was still dead. Rumble. It was, his stomach. It communicated to him with its mighty roar. Looking at the titan he had slain last night. Yes, I deserve a mighty breakfast after that. 
As old tradition of heroic tales postulates, the first thing after a great victory was of course the great feast. After plundering his rations like a viking and filling his stomach to the brim, he felt a lot better. His leg also felt a lot better. Status. Name, Seth Smith. Title, Faster Than The Thought. Level, 12. EXP, 8%. Race, Orihuma. Sex, Male. Age 23. Class, Spirit Blacksmith, Unique. Affiliation, None. Health, 832-1000. Mana, 160-214.2, 210-4.2. Strength, 37. Dexterity, 37. Agility, 27. Intelligence 16 plus 5. Will power 27. Endurance 37. Personality 12. Luck 17. Free AP, attribute points 33. Free SP, skill points 8. Defense. Physical, 241, 111 plus 50 plus 80, ENDX 3. Magical, 94, 54 plus 25 plus 15, WILX 2. Fire resistance 100%, 50% plus 70%. Seth's health had started recovering. That was good. It actually jumped up while he was looking at it. His endurance had greatly increased, did it maybe work like vitality in some games? He hardly remembered all the notifications he had gotten after killing the juvenile, so he checked all the windows to not miss anything. He remembered something about skills, so that was the first thing he checked. As his second most viewed window, he immediately saw the changes. Skill window. Calm reaction, passive, leave 6. Blacksmith, apprentice, leave 7, 40%. Blacksmith size leave 3. Fire manipulation leave 5. Blueprint, apprentice, leave 2. Weapon mastery, adept, leave 2, 92%. Spirit smithy leave 2. Spirit capture leave 3. Map leave 2. Fear Resistance Leave 7. Fire Affinity Leave 8. Soul Infusion Leave 2. Observation Leave 2. Concealment Leave 3. Enchantment, Beginner, Leave 1. The first thing that caught his attention was the new skill. Looking at the description he understood why Soul Infusion was titled a Primitive Enchantment. Enchantment, Beginner, Leave 1. Unlocks the Enchantment Catalog. The skill of bestowing an object with a magical property. The skill description was quite lacking, but he soon found out why. The enchantment catalog gave more information. The catalog was a window with several tabs. The descriptions of the four tabs gave a deeper insight about the branches of the skill. Scan, magic circuits, forging ballads, enchantments. The enchantments tab was grayed out, so he could only guess what it did by method of elimination. Magic circuits worked by creating specific ways for the magic power to travel like engraving or inlays. When magic was flowing in these lines the weapon or armor could obtain a specific effect. Forging ballads was described as singing or chanting during the forging to weave the magic property into the material. It was similar to soul infusion. But different from soul infusion both seemed to need external power to be activated and were not permanently active. Enchantments would then have to be something a magician or wizard did traditionally in games. Seth was a blacksmith, so it was probably grayed out because of his class. Enchantment was different from blueprint as he did not get any beginner enchantments to train with. The scan tab was an empty window with a something like an item slot. His game knowledge told him that he would most likely have to collect examples himself, what a pain. He tried putting his ring in, but was told that his skill level was too low to scan it. Enchantment was obviously a complex skill and this was not really the time to. Wait. The level of map had gone back to 2? Did he get special treatment for praying or was it a f asterisking joke? After all, this overpowered skill had been almost useless in his situation. At least he had gotten back the SP. He had a lot of SP now. He also remembered something about a quest, Seth never really paid much attention to the quest window, so it was his first time noticing a different tab in the window. It was labeled as system and he found the next level and the next level 2 lit up. Chapter 30 Snakes in a Barrel Quest, the next level 2 Difficulty Reach level 15 Rewards, Inventory Space, System Rights. System Rights? Seth opened the grade out the next level and found exactly the same description. What did he unlock then? Maybe it was a window? 
How would he open it if he had no idea how it was called? It was then, that Seth remembered that calling out the windows was a shortcut. Like in most games, all windows existed as a tab in the main window, his status. What he found beside the skill, inventory, and quest tab was. Social. There were party options, like distribution of experience and inviting other players. And there was a friend list. He had expected more from something called system rights, but it was literally just the access to more perks. It did not help a lot. As the only person in town with zero friends, Seth could hardly make a party with anybody. What really positively surprised him were the titles. Even when some of them were weird, titles seemed always worth collecting. Seth felt like he had spent enough time on his menu windows. The AP and SP could wait for now. There were more important things, like looting, right? In his inventory he saw the soul of the big serpent. Soul, large, crafting material. Uncommon. The large soul of a big beast that experienced its first rank up. It was a little underwhelming, but blacksmith's eyes also told him that the big carcass held a lot of material he could harvest. It would not be easy to harvest it, though. Aside from its enormous size, more than half its body was still stuck in the lower floor and only about one-fourth was reaching over the edge of the roof. But Big Bro System surprised him once again. He touched the corpse and was able to store the whole body in one item slot. After storing the body, he checked the situation. His was in a hurry last night and did not check the roof access. There was no door to the staircase up here. Seth only found a hatch. The bottom below the hatch was filled with snakes, but the ladder up to the hatch was collapsed, so they could not reach the rooftop. Seth knew XSCTLY what to do, after seeing the squirming mess of snakes below. Almost too easy, Seth smirked. He felt better now, but he was still filled with resentment. These little vermin had almost cost him his life. So, what if their mommy was a field boss? He would grind all her babies to dust if they dared to come here. Of course, he could have used his bow to shoot them now, like fish in a barrel. He had even gotten back most of the arrows that were stuck in their big brother when he stored him. But it did not seem worth the ammunition. He had barely one stack, it was probably not enough, anyways. Seth had a better plan. He summoned the spirit smithy and started throwing anything metal he found on the roof into the furnace. The weapons in his inventory were the best he had made in the last few weeks. There was no way he would sacrifice them here. The most he could make with the things he found on the roof was medium iron. It would suffice. What he made were the big, mean, and ancient uncles of lawn darts, plumbata. They were throwing darts the size of crossbow bolts and similar to weighted arrows. Seth forged 15 plumbata completely from metal and attached a small loop for a rope to retrieve them. Original they were thrown to disrupt the charge of infantry man, followed by a volley of arrows. Now, Seth chucked them at an army of angry snakes, who were helpless against this merciless reaper from above. Ding. You have killed baby Titano Boalive 1 you have earned experience. Ding. You have killed Boalive 7 you have earned experience. Ding. You have killed baby Titano Boalive 3 you have earned experience. Ding. You have killed baby Titano Boalive 5 you have earned experience. Ding. You have killed Boalive 2 you have earned experience. Every throw was a hit, but not always a kill. There was also a wide variety in level among the snakes below. Some were also only regular snakes, while others were babies. The experience he gained from this was ambiguous, but he could see the bar grow in exceedingly small increments. Similarly, his weapon's mastery inched closer to the next level. Like a machine, Seth kept throwing the 15 plumbata and reeled them back in. Sometimes with a corpse attached to them. In those moments he felt like a spearfisher or a whaler. The baby Titanoboas found their way into his inventory, as their skin was labeled as crafting material. Seth kept going all morning, it did not cost him much stamina to throw the darts straight down at his helpless victims. You may think this way cruel, but all of those snakes were enraged and thirsted for his blood. They did not deserve better. Seth steeled his resolve and kept going all morning. Ding. Title, Snake That Earned. You have killed over 100 snake-type enemies. Plus 10% damage to snake-type enemies. At noon Seth decided, that it was time for a break, to replenish his energy. He had a lot of dead snakes, it was only natural that he skewered them on sword and started roasting them over the forge. He salivated over the lightly salted meat. It had been long since he had fresh meat and these baby snakes smelled better than expected. Some when in the afternoon he actually leveled up to 13. 
How many snakes had he killed? If he had not pulled up most to the bodies, they would easily pile up to his hatch. Kills came a little faster, after Weapon Mastery finally overcame the hurdle and reached LV.3. Finally, their numbers started to dwindle. And at last, no new snakes appeared below the hatch anymore. And when the last one died. Ding. Title, Master Skywalker, earned. Not even the younglings survived. You have eradicated a whole generation of a specific tribe slash race slash organization. Younglings will avoid you, adults will hate you. Currently applies to, snakes. Seth had hoped for this kind of title after gaining the first one. Now the small ones would avoid him and he could get out of here. He just had to avoid meeting another big guy. It could not be that hard. Seth's guess was, that the outskirts were the hatching ground or something, so there should be mostly small ones. Otherwise, there would not have been just one juvenile, right? Right? In the space below the hatch were only dead snakes left, so Seth deemed it safe to climb down. He almost slipped on the blood and corpse-covered floor when he landed. Catching his balance, he came to stand in the middle of the pandemonium he created. The hallway was filled with dead snake-like spaghetti and they were covered in their own tomato sauce. Seth felt a little weird, but he hesitated to leave this much fresh meat behind. So, he ended up storing all the snakes, no matter whether they were normal one, or the babies. He ended up with almost two stacks of Titanoboa and one of normal snakes. He also had collected half a stack of souls, small. Thank the system, that his inventory had been expanded to 5x5. Going down the staircase Seth saw the devastation the juvenile left behind when it had wreaked havoc the other night. The barricades were crushed and broken. The management floor was wiped out. The babies had left, but the normal snakes that were still in the building attacked him. They obviously counted as adults, even when they were weaker than the babies. Luckily, his raft was still where he left it. With this Seth left behind the crime scene of his struggle and slaughter. Chapter 31. Pulling the plug? Arjit Noer. Arjit Noer had been invaded by a terrifying enemy. Contrary to expectations, disgusting creatures had invaded from a new world they wanted to explore. Before the expedition forces could even expand their influence, everyone had been called back when the biggest company had been completely wiped out. Several hundred atrocities had crossed the gate and eradicated the stationed guards and supply units before the other side could somehow close the gate. All expeditions to that world had been called back as a precaution. Other groups also brought unsettling news. Uncommonly well-organized resistance by bands of natives, bone-corroding mists and darkness, metal golems, and never-before-seen monsters. A group had been crushed by roots the moments they left the pathworks and some others met a creature wielding a terrifying pale flame. What kind of chaotic world was this earth? How much information did the church of the system hold back? Why did he have to go back there? The empire had needed several weeks to control and barely contain the region, where the atrocities had invaded. The situation was judged stable, which was why the expeditions were resumed. This time not from the main plane, but from a vassal world just to be on the safe side. He was a summoner specialized on fire elementals. He had been part of the expedition that met a giant animated forest and barely survived thanks to his specialization. Now he and others of similar occupation with fire specialization were scheduled for the destination, where the pale flame had occurred. In case it appeared again, they would be more capable to deal with it, than necromancers and undead. Their destination was described as a partly ruined city of incredible dimension that was on the verge of desertification a perfect environment for their department. It was the morning of the day they would set off. The sun was dim, the air was murky and everything was tinted in a heart-calming gray. The priests gave a motivational speech and got everyone excited. They would build a bridgehead in that world and recover their losses. And more. Everyone was showing a manic expression as the ink black gate opened in front of their expedition force. An ear-piercing roar of water, screams of terror and pain. Overwhelming pressure ripping them apart. These were the last impressions of the expedition force, as a wall of water rushed out of the portal like a gigantic tidal wave. The orderly rows of soldiers vanished in seconds as they were ground away under the force of the cataclysm. He was desperately clinging to a tree as the water tried to take him away with domineering might. It was pure luck. His position was away from the direct impact and he was not killed instantly like the priests who had opened the floodgates. Now, there was no one here who could close those gates. Was there even anyone able to go against the rushing water and reach the gate? He could see glimpses of others vanishing in the current and heard their muffled screams as their lives perished like a candle in the wind. His arms started to weaken. 
he had clung to this tree for what felt like an eternity and the current did not weaken one bit. His summons were all fire base, none of them could do more than die a meaningless death. His hands started to slip. This was the end for him, so he released all the contracts with his summons. He did not want to drag them down with him. The next moment he had already vanished in the floodwaters. Deltan. Seth had been on the water for a day and a night. He was not traveling fast, even without the snakes bothering him. He had reached the border of the city, the houses were shorter and the water seemed shallower here. Still, most ruins did not break the surface anymore, but were visible below like coral reefs. This was a whole other perspective of a sunken city. The view helped Seth enjoy the journey despite the ambiguous speed. Food and water were no problem right now, so he just enjoyed the break. No work, no danger. Just boring relaxing silence. He used the wind and moved in a meandering line towards Starta. Seth had a lot of time to think now and used it to invest his free points. He first distributed his attribute points. With his last level up he had 41, so he tried to even out his stats and kept 6 behind, just in case. Selecting the skill points, he had 9 now, he noticed that Spirit Smithy had unlocked. Concentrating on the skill he could now switch through every part of the smithy and read their description. Level 3 cost him 2 SP. Now the crafting stations were able to work with rare material and a new one was added. Engraving table, crafting station. Equipped with all the basic tools needed for the engraving of ornaments and magic circuits. Integrated catalog of basic patterns for ornamental engraving. Fitted with a magic formation to guide magic power and test circuits. Fitted with a magic formation to steady your hand while following registered patterns. This explained why it had unlocked after he had obtained the enchantment skill. Seth was not a fan of overly ornate weapons, but he was open to make them if the effects were worth it and it got him proficiency. He had 7 SP left. The next decision was hard. Seth did not want to squander SP on skills he could train on his own, like observe or concealment. He had been constantly using concealment since he resumed his journey to train it and actually managed to get it to leave 4. Level 5 would cost 5 SP, it did not seem worth it. Seth decided that he did not have to spend his SP at all. He would save the rest and wait until he could raise Spirit Smithy again. Maybe he could level up all his specific class skills at the same time? What was left now was relaxing and staying on course. It was some time later he noticed on the map, that he was moving backwards. What was going on? When he looked in the direction of the city center, he could see nothing. Once again, his trusty binocular showed it s worth. The water was still calm here but closer to the city center Seth could see rapids forming among the building and ruins. Wait. Was that a maelstrom in the center? He had to stop the raft now. It would never be able to survive those rapids. And he would never survive a run-in with a Titanoboa on this nutshell. Even less without it. Good thing he had kept the makeshift grappling hook as an anchor. With this he could anchor at one of the submerged buildings nearby. Maybe he could wait this one out? Just what did he think? Seth had been anchored for several hours now and the sun was about to go down. Would he have to stay here for the night? The water had sunk by almost two meters. He could not imagine where all the water was going, but he was glad, not to be there. When the night fell, he was trying to get some sleep, but as the water sank more and more rapids formed with buildings and ruins resurfacing. The noise from the maelstrom became louder and louder. It was hard, but Seth fell asleep in the end. Chapter 32. Night on the Water Seth woke up the next morning. His raft stood on solid ground. The water level had sunk too much, that Seth's raft was now standing on the rooftop he had been anchored to. He drowsily crawled to the roof edge and saw that he was several stories above the water surface. Just how much water was this? And it was drained away in just a night. Seth was shocked, but his mood was lifted soon. If this much water had been drained, then his search for dry land might have shortened tremendously. But how would he get his raft down to the water? It was the first time he could not store something in his inventory. Even so the raft was not terribly big, the system denied to recognize it as a single object. Oh well, why overthink things, he mumbled and chucked the raft off the building, into the water. The splash was big and loud, but the raft held together. Now he had to get down fast. If he was too slow, the raft would just drift off in the current. Should I just jump, he pondered. Seth looked into the depth and his heart palpitated. Nat, I am good, with this Seth plunged toward the door to the staircase. Everything was slimy and slippery. The doors, the handle, 
the guardrails and the stairs soaked and covered in a film of algae. His shoes barely found grip on his way down. Seth had to slow down his descent, if he didn't want to tumble down the stairs and reach the raft with a few broken bones. He felt that his body had become a lot sturdier with his increase in attributes, but the fall damage never cared about your character level, in games. The rooms he could see into were filled rubbish and debris, with the one or other fish in between. What kind of fish is this supposed to be, Seth called out. He had almost reached the raft when he saw a beast as big as himself stranded in one of the rooms he passed. It was reminiscent of armored catfish he used to catch with his dad, just a lot bigger. The fish was easily longer than twice his height. Its body covered in thick articulated bone scales. Different from the small ones he knew, this one had a face like a deep sea fish with big bulging eyes and long protruding teeth. It made Seth seriously consider returning back to the giant snakes. Should he really get back on the water? if creatures like this were out there? The better question was, could he stay here until the water was gone? But Seth was not sure, whether the water would even completely drain. Anyways, he had to get to his raft, fast. So, he left the writhing and gasping monster fish behind and hurried to his little vessel. He barely reached it before it was too far away and resumed his journey. He had to use his paddle to fight the weak pull from the maelstrom in the far distance. His sea travel became boring soon. Seth left behind Deltan and could soon stop paddling. Relying on his sail he moves as a tiny little spot, over a vast expanse of open water. Only his map indicated that he was moving at all. The sun was unpleasantly burning from the sky onto Seth's pale skin. Three weeks indoors made him look like a vampire. But three weeks of hard work had also made him look fit and well trained. So, he did not look like a shut-in, despite his title. Now the sun was hard at work to tan his skin, or burn him. Should he have built a shelter on his little nutshell? Seth tried to cover himself with the black cloth, but it became terribly stifling below it. He welcomed the cool breeze once the sun finally set. The night was even more magical than the first time he had traveled on the plains. The moon and stars shone bright in the night sky. Their reflection on the calm water, like in a mirror, shone back up to them from below. The image only disrupted by the little vessel and Seth drifting along in a doubled firmament. It was still warm below his black blanket and the warmth slowly lulled him into sleep. Cough. Cough, a tiny coughing drove the weariness away. A little humanoid was desperately clinging to the edge of his raft. Seth knelt down to take a better look. Name. Level, asterisk. Race, fairy. Affiliation, fair folk. It was a fairy. Its little wings were limp and soaked and it used its last energy to grasp the lower edge of a pallet. Help. Please, a quiet and rough voice came from the poor thing. Who huma and please help Finn. Teary dark eyes looked up at him as its small hand started to lose strength and slip. Carefully Seth scooped the little being out of the water. Seth finally had the chance to see a fairy from close up. The smooth white body felt cold on his hand as he brought the shivering fairy in front of his face. Its eyes were big and round and completely black, sclera and iris, both. Please help, others. It mumbled before all tension left its body and it fell asleep. Others, Seth looked into the darkness. He could see nothing but the stars mirrored on the surface. And then a pale light illuminated his surroundings for tens of meters. Seth used fire manipulation to turn his hand into a torch. The soul fire easily overpowered the starlight and became a new sun between the firmaments. He could see all kinds of broken rubbish floating. Some had a fairy or two clinging to them, some were fairies themselves. Hey you little ones. Swim to the flame. If you still have the power to, the last part he whispered. Some of those he saw started moving towards him. Others seemed to barely react. Instead of waiting, Seth started paddling around with his raft, holding one of his hands in the air. Meandering around on his raft, collecting all the fairies he could find. Many were barely awake, others barely alive. Seth spread the black cloth on a corner of the raft, so the fairies could lie down and dry themselves. He also collected those who did not move anymore and put them into his inventory. Maybe they would want to bury them or something. When he could not see any more, Seth extinguished the fire. He had probably looked for almost two hours now and he had no idea how long they had been adrift here. He did not want to think about it, but those he did not find might have already ended up in a fish. The fairies sat or laid on the black cloth, some used the corners for cover and warmth. They did not talk, most of the were asleep now. Those away stared in the distance. 
It really reminded Seth of the scene in a movie after a ship accident. Seth's heart sank and he felt sorry, watching their small broken and shivering figures. H human thank you for saving Finn and her friends, a quite squeaking voice came from his side. It was the first fairy, that had clung to his raft. It had recovered and watched Seth collecting her brethren and decided to speak now. Her eyes sparkled with gratefulness. Seth got the raft back on course and had a conversation with Finn. A very one-sided conversation, as a flood of word bubbled out of her. The fairies had found this exit of the pathworks that led to the plains a few weeks ago and decided to settle here, as the grassland was great to grow their preferred flowers. Originally, they kept in contact, but soon contact was lost. So, they put together a search party. Fairies were bad with water. Really bad, as you can see. The exit of the pathworks was now submerged. When they exited, they were thrown into rapid water, as the water rushed into the portal. Someone had managed to close it early and the water calmed down. They could swim to the surface at this point. Oh no. What about home, she said in panic as if this was Finn's first time thinking of it. It was probably her first chance to think of other things than survival. Seth looked at his map. We will soon reach Starta, if it is still there. I bet the church there can help you. Finn nodded her small head with new hope. When the night sky started to become brighter, they closed in on Starta. Chapter 33. Simon of the Lake. Starta. The morning sun glimpsed over the horizon. Its rays painted beautiful moving patterns on the cobblestone streets of Starta as it fell through the water. The water level had suddenly fallen a lot faster than Simon had anticipated and the dome above the city was peeking through the water surface. The few villagers that had stayed during this rainy season could see an underwater world outside the bubble that covered the city. All kinds of fascinating a weird fish flying over their heads like birds. Some even visited Starta for this view, others had returned to the empire for the time being, as they could not do their jobs. The old priest was checking and adjusting the barrier. With this much water pressure gone this fast, the barrier might have blown up, if he had not kept an eye on the magic's output. Simon actually enjoyed this season. The blurry sun shining through the water was something quite extraordinary and sweetened the boring work of barrier maintenance. But on this great morning a big piece of driftwood blocked the light of the morning sun. Seth's rinky-dink little nutshell was floating above the village and had lodged onto the dome. The fairies, even Finn, had finally fallen asleep and he was barely able to stay awake. When the map told him that they had reached their destination, Seth could only see a shallow platform breaking the water surface. Looking over the edge of the raft he understood that it was the tip of a giant hemisphere, that covered the village below them. He could see the streets and houses from above like a bird. A medieval town existing on the bottom of a lake was something different from seeing a modern city flooded by water. It was a lot more, magical. Ha! Huh. I was right. Seth celebrated in a tired voice. That Santa Claus priest did have a way to counter this disaster. But how do we get in, this was the big question. Seth was perplexed as the raft went aground on the dome with a thunk and lodged itself there. Well, at least they did not have to worry about drifting away now that they were stuck. It was as Seth thought about a way to get into the barrier or get someone's attention, that he followed an age-old human instinct. Knock on the glass of an aquarium. He was startled when he almost lost balance and fell off the raft. His knuckle passed the energy membrane like a soap bubble. The situation had instantly changed. Seth's raft was not stuck on solid ground. It was a platform reaching over the precipice of a more than 10m deep cavern. You could tell him whatever you wanted about attributes and supernatural systems, he did not want to take such a fall. Heights were just not his thing. It's not about the danger, it is a matter of principle. Seth looked back and forth between the limp fairies and the abyss in front of him. They were not fit to fly down there with their own power. He frowned hard, but sighed in the end. The young man saw only one option, he had to climb down there and get help. Poking the little Finn with his finger, he woke her up. Finn we are here. Can you look after your friends? I will climb down there and ask for help. Seth had told Finn about Starta during the night. She was happy that they were traveling to a village of the Krina Empire. She had told him a lot about the Pathworks and as followers of the Church of the System, Finn described the Empire's people as one of the friendly factions that used the Pathworks. As such they had friendly relationships with most races, the fairies being one of them. Seth took out two ropes. He would use one to climb down and prepared the other so he could tie a basket to it and pull it up like an elevator for the fairies. Even if the Church did not help him, he could just buy a basket with the stuff in his inventory. 
Simon stood flabbergasted on the control panel of the barrier and stared to the top of the dome. From the driftwood that had blocked his son, a rope fell to the ground. And another? Following the ropes was the lean figure of a wild-looking man peeking over the edge of the driftwood. His scraggly beard looked unkempt and the mix of dark cloth and plates he wore looked scratched up and a little dirty. The priest rushed to the town square below it. The guy clumsily and slowly climbed down one of the ropes. Simon felt a slight discomfort when he reached the mostly empty square. Had the man just used observation on him? With pain and misery Seth climbed down the rope. It was one thing to climb up, it was another when he had to go down. He used observation to remember the priest's name and felt it used on himself soon after. Hey. Simon. I am back, the youth greeted Simon awkwardly. Simon was not polite and also used observation on the man in front of him. Seth. He could see nothing but general things like name, level, and age, even so he was several tens of levels higher than the young man. What? This is supposed to be that boy, Simon thought, astounded about the changes. Seth had been tall to begin with, but the last time he saw him he looked pale and thin, almost sickly. He was still pale, with a light sunburn maybe? The biggest change was his build. His shoulders seemed wider and he looked quite muscular under the armor. What did he do in those weeks? Simon? Hey priest, Seth waved his hand in front of the old man's face to wake him from his stupor. Oh. Eh, hey, yes. Seth. Hello, the priest reacted awkwardly. Seth did not mind their weird greeting and started to explain the situation to the rotund priest then and there. Simon proved once again that he was a really friendly old man and immediately agreed to help and take care of the fairies. He would make sure to help them return home as soon as possible. When Seth explained to Simon how he wanted to get the fairies down, the other shook his head with a smile and stopped Seth. He called two priests who started chanting and gesturing. The next thing he saw was the raft gently entering the bubble and floating to the ground. Simon's and the other priest's face fell when they saw the condition the fairies were in. Unconscious, hypothermic, some with bleeding injuries, broken wings, and limbs. In daylight they looked even worse than during the night. Seth felt depressed upon witnessing their suffering. A warm hand landed on Seth's shoulder. Simon gave him a kind smile. You look like you had some rough time. My people will take care of them for now. How about you come with me to the church? The world changes after a warm bath. What do you think about a set of clean clothes and a healthy meal? After that we can talk. I have a nice tea and fresh cookies in my office. Cookies. Chapter 34. The Choice. Simon was right. It was a bliss to finally be able to take a warm bath after so long. The moment his body submerged in the warm soapy water his fatigue was lifted. Seth actually fell asleep. But after a short nap he was woken by the call of a maid, who had brought a fresh set of simple clothing. The outfit fit the commoner style of the empire he had seen in town, but was very comfy to wear. What waited for him when he left the bath was a table filled with food. Soup, bread, fruits, desserts various kinds of meat dishes, noodles, rice, and sauces. Seth and the priest did not talk during the scrumptious meal. Quite the contrary, while Seth did not have such an excessive feast for a long time and had reason to shovel food and drink into his belly without a single word, Simon did the same. The rotund priest was vacuuming food into himself like a person close to starvation. The young man and old priest fought a merciless battle of supremacy on the dinner table. One trying to decimate food faster than the other. The outcome of this battle would stay inconclusive, as both adversaries collapsed under the constant supply of food the demonic maids brought to the table. In their last moment they finally bonded over the realization, that they were not each other's enemy. Both had been fighting an uphill battle against the dark forces of the church, the maids. This gluttonous beast cough priest was already bad enough. Now we have another person with a black hole for a stomach, the maids lamented mischievously looking at their victims, who laid collapsed in a food coma on the ground. They woke up at roughly the same time. Both had recovered from the bout of overwhelming satiety and were ready for round two. So, T, Simon asked the young man with a roguish smile. And cookies, Seth demanded. Both stood up and waddled off, to the priest's office. Both grunting like old man they sat down on opposite sides of the desk. Once they each had a cup of steaming tea and a plate of cookies was settled on the desk between then, Seth told Simon his story. Seth obviously omitted some parts about his class, but he described it as a variation of a blacksmith class. It was easier than coming up with some bullshit lie. He had also started to trust the priest and his church a little more, 
after listening to Finn's monologue. The past weeks had been very eventful and Seth had majorly calmed down, compared to the first time he had come to Starta, when he was just someone driven like a fugitive. He became clearer about his situation and more confident in his class and himself. The revelations he had about his class, as the level and number of skills grew and the near-death experiences, he collected showed him a direction. The apocalypse was dangerous, but had many opportunities for the strong and prepared. The world was in a constant change and would just grow more dangerous in the future, while his skill already started to stagnate. It lacked what he needed the most right now. Knowledge. He could not grow fast enough to harvest the fortunes. If he stayed alone in this world, it would soon overwhelm him, so he made a decision. Say, Simon, could I use the pathworks to travel to Krona Empire, he asked when their conversation paused for a while. Seth's idea was simple. To grow his skills he not only needed rare materials. He needed more knowledge about enchantments, weapon patterns, and materials. Earth was changing right now, he would not be able to find what he needed here. Seth was sure he could find what he needed easier if he could enter an already developed magical world with a stable society. And once he had all the basics down, he could go wherever he wanted. Simon raised his eyebrows about Seth's sudden request. Hum hum, maybe. If you remember, outsiders are not allowed to help you too much unless you join their faction. Yes, I remember. Why the sudden change of mind, Simon asked. He still remembered that Seth had seemed quite opposed to joining a faction before. Well, things happened. I had a long talk with a fairy that would not shut up. And the fact that your god probably had some fun at my cost may have convinced me that you are not just talking nonsense. Hum HOH? God pranked you? That means he likes you, the priest said smiling. It was not often, their god took his time to spend special attention on someone. Just to be clear, I want to join if I have to take order from anyone and I want to disclose my skills willingly and... Seth stopped mid-sentence, when the old man in front of him suddenly started cackling like a hyena. He would just not stop. His eyes even started tearing up. It was Seth's turn to lift an eyebrow. Ha 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 ha. So that was what you were worried about? Sorry to be laughing about your worries, but it's a hilarious idea from my perspective. God would punish us, if we interfered that much with an orihuma. I am glad it was something this simple, wiping away a tear the old priest bowed down to rummage around in his desk drawer. In the end he put a form in front of Seth. Here. This is a simple contract to become a lay follower of the system church. With this you can use the pathworks at any system church for a small fee and you can stay within the territory of the Krina Empire and any other faction that acknowledged the church. Great, right. Seth was a little wary. This went way too easy. Sounds great, yes. What is the catch? Hum hum, a catch, the old man's eyes glinted, let me be honest. The church will not actively help you. Even if we help you, it won't be for free. You will be barred from joining any other faction in the Pathworks or other worlds. This is a lot less than other factions will offer you, but their catch will be expectation in you. The church on the other hand will guarantee your identity and won't care about whatever you do, as long as you don't break any laws. We offer you the freedom you want in exchange of denying you free help. This speech might have sounded cruel for some people, but it was great new for Seth. He did not need help and was afraid of others meddling in his affairs. But why do we offer this weird deal? Don't look at me like that. It's written on your face. It's simple, it's part of our doctrine. Taking you in and making others unable to interfere is defending our God's interests. Freedom is struggle, struggle is fun to watch. Simon shrugged his shoulders. Just sign here. The sooner you sign, the faster we can talk about where you wish to travel, Simon smirked. He was sure it was an offer, Seth could not refuse. Seth kept staring at the paper and reading the translation of what was written. It was true, everything Simon had said was written in the document. He lightheartedly signed the contract. Simon smiled, he was sure the young man had made the right decision. They kept talking a long time even till deep into the night. About Seth's rough goals and the territories that could be reached from their current position. Seth also tried to get some secrets out of the old priest, but the other stayed mute about anything that would spoil Seth, about his future. It was late when they finished talking and a maid brought Seth to a guest room. Ah. Wait. Can you bring me to the room the fairies are staying, Seth suddenly asked the maid. The maid pondered for a moment. Yes, 
I think that s okay, she said and turned around. She gestured Seth to follow her and brought him to a room the same size as his. On the big bed sat a lot of tiny figures with cast down faces. Their wounds had been treated for the most part, some still had bandages and splints. They all turned their head toward the door in unison when it opened. Arim, hello, Seth said awkwardly, not knowing what else to say. Hello Seth. Did Seth come to meet Finn, the only overloaded ball of energy among them shot at him like a bullet. Her overexcited behavior really made him smile, despite the heavy task he was burdened with right now. Yes and no Finn. Actually, there is something I wanted to tell you. All of you, with this all the unfocused stares of the fair folk landed on him. I am sorry, if I am a little late with this, but that night I also. I collected your dead, too. Of course, I don't know your practices and maybe I did something wrong, but it did not seem right to leave them there for the fish and birds to. Maybe you want to, Seth stuttered and spoke really fast to get this rather uncomfortable task over with. He was interrupted by an older looking fairy suddenly rushing up to him and grabbing his collar. D did you say you collected them, an unprecedented light was filling it s black eyes. Ah, er yes, Seth nodded a little stumped. It was not just the fairy before him, even the others on the bed had a tiny glimmer in their eyes. What a fortune. Are they in your inventory? Can you please take them out, the elder fairy s voice. Seth did not really know what was going on, but he came before the crowd on the bed and one by one put almost forty fairy bodies on the bed in front of them. It was almost as many, as there were survivors. Each body brought a gasp or tears from among the crowd. Some more some less, but the fairies always seemed glad to see them, more than sad over their death. You are probably confused now Seth, right, on his shoulder sad Finn. Her extreme energy and high pitch has subsided. She seemed almost mature, as she looked down at her people with tiny smile and little teary eyes. Maybe I will tell you in the future, she added cheekily and flew away. Seth saw that the fairies were occupied with their own matter and used the chance to leave for his own room. Chapter 35 Denied? Was it disloyal to leave his home world, just because it became a hot mess of near-death experiences? Maybe a little. However, Seth decided that staying was not an option right now. Seth had not lied a lot about his class, so it was relatively easy to talk with the old priest Simon about a fitting destination. It would take two or three days to prepare the passage since they were also working on one to send the fairies back home. He felt a lot better after settling their matter. With a calm conscience Seth spent almost the entire first day in bed. The tension and the emergency had kept him awake for an entire night and the nap in the bath and the food had helped, but had not been enough. So, his body took the chance and demanded its due sleep. He had only left the bed for food and the call of nature. And so, he started his second day of his stay in starter refreshed and with a good mood. One of the priests had informed him that his passage would be ready the next day. Seth planned to settle his preparations by then. He had talked with Simon about stuff like the currency of the empire. Maybe because everything is governed by an RPG-like system, the currency followed the typical trend. Factions following the system church had gold, silver, and bronze coins. 100 bronze coins were 1 silver and 100 silver were 1 gold. These coins were made with a unique skill of a class called Minter. The coins would not take up inventory space, but turn into a money display, just like in games. The first thing he wanted to do, was to get rid of all the weapons that were clogging up his inventory. Which meant selling them. Seth arrived at Claude S., the blacksmith S., shop early in the morning. The streets were almost empty, otherwise people would have seen a tall muscular youth standing around and looking up every few steps. Looking up at the water above amazed Seth every time. Watching all kinds of fish and stuff swim past like in a reverse aquarium was fascinating. He could not really appreciate the view during his arrival, for obvious reasons. Entering the small blacksmith's shop, his eyes wandered over the display. This time, it was Seth's turn to see small flaws and mistakes in the weapons of his fellow blacksmith. Not. He could only interpret the information he got from blacksmith's eyes. Seth was far from having enough experience to see flaws in Claude's works. The practical forging skill and execution was still better than Seth's. If anything, he could only guess that their ratings were lower, because of the material and equipment used. Everything was at most medium iron and Seth guessed that this was the reason he had gotten medium iron as a recipe once smelting had reached the required level. It had been in his material catalog ever since then. Seth felt the gaze of the old blacksmith on him. H.O.H. 
Young man, you have changed quite a bit, since we last me, he admired as his eyes roamed across Seth's body and armor. Ha ha, yeah, Seth said discomfort by the old man's wandering eyes. I stayed in seclusion to train my skill. Until I almost drowned, that is, he joked. Oh my god. The young people these days. Not only talent, but even diligence. I heard about your spectacular arrival with a boatload of fairies. But we can talk about you adventures later, if you want, the shop owner cackled. Come here, let this old man see how much your skills have grown. Claude waved his hand for Seth to come closer to the counter. He smiled amiably at Seth. Claude had always been a forging enthusiast and chose to be a blacksmith, despite not really having the talents. Still, he was not bitter about his choice and appreciated every new young talent of his trade he met. Since laying eyes on that billhook, he looked forward to Seth overtaking him in the future. Unhesitatingly Seth stepped forth and took out one of the swords he made for practice, from his inventory. He had done these a lot, since he had chosen the sword as own of his weapon. It was a fantasy staple after all. Of course, it was one without a soul or properties. It was still an uncommon rated weapon, though. The young man put an unadorned long sword on the table in front of Claude. With a rough look, the experienced blacksmith could see that it was a very traditional and functional form, unlike the more modern trends the youths nowadays chose. What started as a look of appreciation upon seeing the traditional design, soon became a look of shock. Future? What future? This young man had almost overtaken him in the present. The weapon he had shown him during their first meeting had already been very promising, but it still had many hammer marks and gouges back then. This simple sword was almost flawless. One really had to nitpick to complain about this weapon. The practical skills were already remarkably close to his own, Seth's skills had tremendously increased in the brief time since their first meeting. To top it off, the material really boosted the performance. Claude was almost jealous. All he was given as the smith of a starter village was medium iron. He had no chance to get his hand on steel. This weapon was better than most of the things in his shop. My young friend, your growth is truly monstrous. I would not dare to find fault with your works, Claude laughed happily. He really looked forward to Seth's future. If they became friends, maybe he could see truly legendary pieces then? Anyways, you are probably not here just to bask in this old man's praise. What can I do for you? I have been talking with Simon and I joined the church as a lay follower. I will leave this world soon to grow my skills. So I was going to get some funds and wanted to sell the weapons I made. Would you be willing to buy them? Claude was a little surprised, but asked the young man to show him his wares. Seth continued to pour out weapons from his inventory onto the counter. To save space he had chosen to make less different weapons and more of one kind, so he could stack them. He had maces, warhammers and other blunt weapons made of medium iron. Swords, axes, daggers and other bladed weapons made of medium steel. Tens of weapons per kind. The old man stumbled upon seeing half an armory pouring onto his counter. He looked at Seth perplexed and blushed with an awkward expression. Watching such an old man go through a plethora of different expressions was, interesting. He he, Seth. You see, look Arim, his eyes shifted around, thinking about what to say. Take a look around my shop, he sighed, most your weapons are easily better than mine. And you have more than me. I can tea buy your items. I do not have the money, to pay you a fair price. I am sorry Seth but I can t help you with this. Seth was flabbergasted. Then he facepalmed hard. Why did he not think of this? No matter how much the system made the world look like a game, people would not have infinite money to just buy his stuff. Claude noticed the young man's reaction and calmed down. Seth seemed to be more embarrassed than himself. Didn't you say that you talked to Simon? Did you not mention, this, he gestured at the heap of weapons. Seth was a little abashed by this question. I'm a why have told him I had so many weapons to sell. The old smith immediately caught on. The priest could not have guessed the magnitude of this business and Seth avoided spilling the beans. He sighed with a smile. Seth, the operation of this village is too small to buy this many weapons of this quality. You really have to talk to Simon about this. He explained that even in the empire no shop would buy that number of weapons. Only a noble, or the military would buy weapons in bulk. It would be hard for Seth to get such a connection but Claude told him, that the system church could act as a mediator in this case, as they were majorly involved in interdimensional trade. 
it explained why a church had so many clerks and counters. So, this was how they made their money, Seth mumbled. All Claude could do was appraise his weapons for him, so he could ask for the right price. Oh yeah, could you tell me what this is worth, Seth mentioned and took out an ingot of Electrum the size of a credit card. Seth just called it Electrum because it sounded cool. He had mixed the silver and gold bars he had made to save inventory space. It was not a recipe in the smelting menu. Seth had found, that he could use fire manipulation to take control of the flame of the furnace. It took a lot of energy, but if the alloy was not worth as much as the pure metals, he could split them again. It was very similar to free creation, it just did not give extra experience. It was the first time he found the system was a little inadequate. He could not split an alloy with the furnace menu. He could choose either gold or silver, but if you had a metal alloy and chose one of the components as the final product, smelting would register all other components as impurities and burn them away. A gold bar, Claude grabbed the golden ingot and bit into a corner. Where did you get this? he asked baffled. Oh, you know, here and there, Seth gave a noncommittal answer. Hmm, all right. Let me check the purity, he continued and rummaged around behind his counter. What appeared in his hands was a device that looked like a digital letter scale without a display. It was about the size of a palm and had a runic magic circle inscribed on it. Curiously, Seth leaned in closer to see what Claude was doing. He put the gold bar in the middle of the scale and then touched the corners of the device. The circle lit up, the metal started glowing and the next thing was a window popping up above the device. It was similar to the system windows. It indicated the elements and their ratio in the bar in per mile. The bar was 789 parts gold and 211 parts silver. Claude sighed when he saw the window. That's shame. I'm sorry Seth, but this gold does not seem very pure. Seth gave the old blacksmith a puzzled look. What do you mean, it's almost 80% gold? Isnt that quite good. Claude shook his head, of course, I didn't say it's worthless. But no matter who will buy it, he will not pay for the silver parts. You need to find someone with at least professional level smelting to split alloys like this. And the work of someone like that would cost more, than the silver is worth, you see? It's a shame for the silver. Seth's jaw dropped to the floor. So, it was not just the blacksmith skill. Smelting became fire manipulation after the rank up to adept. Since he could split alloys with it, although barely, he had once again jumped almost an entire rank. And since the ability grew without needing an exorbitant amount of material to smelt, he got it to this level a lot cheaper. Chapter 36. Touring the town. Oh yeah, Claude. Do you know a place where I can dismantle monsters in town? I have a lot of snake I need to take care of. The old blacksmith once again got the chance to give Seth a puzzled look, just for a different reason. What level are you now, Seth? He asked to make sure. 13. Why? Then you should be able to do it. You should be able to dismantle monster corpses using the inventory, given you have enough space. Do you have something small with you? Then I can show you. The next moment the over 4 meter long corpse of a baby Titanoboa flopped on the shop's floor. You know, I just want to ask where you got this. For my own peace of mind. The old man crouched down and touched the body. He whispered, loot all, and the skin of the snake vanished. Like this you can store all the crafting materials you know of. It's a lot faster, but some of the material will be lost, compared to physically dismantling, he explained, and took out the finished material and showed him, that it had turned into an evenly cut sheet of snake leather. Titanoboa snake leather, crafting material. Come in. The flexible and sturdy skin of an infant Titanoboa. Very suitable for sturdy clothes and light armor. Now you try, the man encouraged Seth. He took out another snake and it easily worked for him, too. And a tanned piece of snake leather appeared in his inventory. If you have a lot of material to loot, I recommend this method. But when you ever come across something truly rare, you should try to find a professional hunter to dismantle it. Even a small piece of skin could be worth its weight in gold in such cases, this made Seth decide, to look for a professional hunter for the juvenile. Although, it's leather was not rare it was uncommon and Seth would appreciate more material to grind his skills. Running his hands along the smooth piece of leather Claude suddenly said, Say, how much of this snake leather do you have? I can tea buy your weapons, but this snake leather seems quite good. Seth took a few minutes to clean out the two stacks of baby boas, 
now he had two stacks of snake leather and two stacks of naked snake bodies. Seth sold 50 snake leather to Claude and finally made his first otherworldly money. The blacksmith had paid him two gold, which meant the leather was roughly four silver per piece. Simon had explained the rough worth of money to him. Three gold was enough for a commoner to live comfortably for a month. Seth did not doubt Claude's price and happily left the blacksmith's shop. For your information, just one of the medium iron maces went for two gold already. Weapons made of steel were even more expensive. Of course, it was the quality that made the price. This was all he had planned for the day, so he was free for now. He thought about returning to the church and talk to Simon, but the town was really empty right now. It was a good chance to explore the fantasy setting and shops. The tailor was the first to pick his interest. Since he would soon travel to a different world, maybe he should try to adjust. Seth entered the shop filled with a range of different clothes. The counter was manned by a bored-looking elderly woman dozing off. The door hitting a bell startled her. Her chin slipped off the hand it was resting on and almost hit the counter. He had been to three shops and all of them were run by elderly people. Were the jobs in these frontier villages like a retirement or something? Not that it affected him, he just felt curious. The lady caught her fall and straightened herself, trying to play off her little plunder. Hello. How may I help you, she gave him a trained smile. Her voice was smooth and melodic despite her age. She gave a nice old granny vibe. He had an easy time describing his situation to her, that he would travel to a province of the empire and he needed comfortable sturdy clothes for travel. She listened attentively. Ah, yes. We can help with that. If you may come over here so I can get your measurements. Measurements? I am leaving tomorrow. No worries. I will just slightly adjust three sets of ready-made clothes for you. It won't take long at all. You can pay when you come to pick them up. Three? But I... Yes, three. Don't try to tell me one is enough. You can t possibly plan to travel with just one set of clothing, do you? She shot down his objections. With this, she took him to the measurement boot in the back. Her movements when measuring him had been really experienced and fast. He doubted his earlier guess about retirement. Maybe they focused on the most experienced people? Fifteen minutes later he was already back on the streets. She had sent him off with a your clothes will be ready tomorrow morning. Make sure to pick them up before you leave. Back outside Seth was still a little puzzled about what happened. His stomach reminded him of his next sequence of actions. The meal yesterday showed him, that he did not need to fear the food of the other world. It seemed quite delicious, at least the high end. Let us see how the restaurants would do. Seth had to search a little, but found an eatery in the end. Compared to the rest of town, it was almost buzzing with business. He took this as a sign of quality. It was very much like you would imagine a medieval tavern, but from movies. There was spacious room with many wooden tables for guests to sit on. It was around noon, and the bright sunlight fell in through big windows onto the smooth, well-made furniture. The room looked clean and the air felt fresh. Seth had not expected it to be this enjoyable. He was able to order a full table of food and wine for just five silver. This was his subjective view, five silver was already pricey for the normal populace. The food was simple, but tasted very good. Not as good as the meal he had yesterday, but definitely better than anything he had cooked for himself in the past weeks. Seth would not suffer, if food like this was a staple in the other world. His belly was full, his needs fulfilled. Seth returned to the church. There was still the talk about the weapons and maybe the priest knew a hunter who could dismantle the snake for him. On his way back, he came across the general store again. Hmm, maybe he could get rid of the three stacks of raw snake here? He would much rather have something preserved he could eat right away, instead of having to cook it. And he should get medical supplies. He would make sure to have at least first aid stuff in his inventory from now on. Eh? If it isnt the orihuma. How's you been doing, the shopkeep greeted him. He seemed friendlier than last time. The man noticed his bewilderment. I heard you help some fairies. Really nice little things. Never hurt anyone. It's good you saved them. Oh, okay, Seth smiled. Well, I wanted to ask, whether you would buy something like this, and slapped one of the naked snake bodies on the counter. The clerk was baffled upon seeing a snake this big. He inspected the body for a while. Do you have more of this? I am willing to give you, 20 bronze for the meat and another 10 for the innards. 
our apothecary should be able to use it for medicine. The shopkeep was stunned when Seth told him, he had several hundred, but he said not no he explained why the meat of low-level beasts was not awfully expensive, so he did not mind stocking up on it. In the end Seth sold the normal snakes for 20, and the boas for 30 bronze each making about 80 silver in total. Obviously, the skins were the most precious parts of the snakes, but Seth did not say no to the meat money. After their deal was done, Seth asked the shopkeep for the location of the apothecary. He bet he could stock up on medicinal supplies there. Maybe they even had real health potions and mana potions. Something like that would have been really cool. The apothecary was located a little off the main street. That was why Seth had not seen his shop before. It was a small building with a small shop window and staff of Aesculapius on its sign. The youngest shopkeeper he had met so far looked up, as Seth entered the pharmacy. The man was in his late twenties or early thirties and looked quite dapper. Hello? what can I do for you, he asked in a friendly baritone. Seth gave the pharmacy a once-over. All kind of little potion bottles were stored in cabinets and the whole wall behind the man was filled with drawers. Oh yeah, I'm looking for medicinal supplies for traveling. Say, you don't have health potions or something like that, right, Seth's eyes were fixed on the shelves with all kinds of colorful bottles. The pharmacist squinted his eyes, but did not use observe as far as Seth felt. Are you an orihuma maybe? To ask for something like health potions in a frontier village, he smiled. He explained, that health potions were a high quality product that needed rare ingredients and a high skill level. Those were normally not available in these starter villages. He offered Seth a first aid kit, which compromised things like bandages, rubbing alcohol and salves. It was all contained in a non-descriptive bag, that reduced the needed inventory space to one. The description of the bag was literally first aid kit. He felt a lot calmer with this in his inventory. Now, it was time to return to the church for Chapter 37 A New Journey Nobody stopped him, when Seth just waltzed into the head priest's office, only to find it empty. It would have been different if he was a normal person, but he was an Orihuma that had joined the church, so most people treated him with leniency. After asking around a little, he found Simon in another wing, with the fairies. Seth, the little Finn screamed when he opened the door. She flew up and started circling Seth like an euphoric fly. Seth greeted her back with a smile and she sat down on his shoulder. Simon was in dialogue with one of the fairies, when Seth entered. It looked a little older and taller than Finn, T was the one that had talked to him so euphorically the other day. The priest signaled to Seth that he would be done soon so Seth left with Finn still on his shoulder. Hey Seth. I heard you will be leaving soon, too, Finn suddenly asked. Are you also going home? Hmm, no, I am leaving home, Seth smiled melancholic. A little like you guys. Suddenly Finn pouted, we are not little. You are just fat. Way too fat. Fat human, she pounded his chest with her tiny fists. Seth started laughing and the light shadow on his heart vanished again. He caught Finn in his hollow hand and explained the misunderstanding to the huffy fairy. Seth? What are you guys doing? the priest asked looking back and forth between the young man and the pouting fairy on his palm. Oh. Nothing, Seth brushed the matter aside. Finn felt a little embarrassed about being seen quarreling like a little child by Simon and rushed past him, back to the other fairies with a beet red face. Seth smiled sheepishly at the priest's quizzical look. I came back to talk to you about something, do you have time now? The two went back to Simon's office. Once they were seated and supplied with tea and cookies, Seth asked about his weapon trade. You mean to say, that you don't have some weapons, as you mentioned before. But a whole weapons shop worth? Show me, the old priest asked with a perplexed look. Seth fidgeted a little awkwardly. After all, it was his fault for keeping secrets and now he had to come back to ask for help. Mace by mace and sword by saber, the priest's face fell in shock until his jaw figuratively hit the ground. Finally a big pile of weapons filled half the office. Seth kept the more unique weapons, like the ones he tested soul infusion on and the plumbata. It took Simon a few minutes to find his speech again. Seth had not thought about how ridiculous the amount of weapons was when he made them. He only realized it, when he tried selling them to Claude. Simon finally cleared his throat and got his bearing back. I fathom Claude told you to come to me? How much, did he say would this all be worth? 7-738 gold would be a fair prize he said. The priest blinked and Seth avoided his gaze abashed. Simon pondered and started nodding. 
he took out a small white piece of marble the size of a shogi piece. He chanted something onto the stone and gave it to Seth. Here, take this. We don't have that much money here. This is a promissory stone over 650 gold. The difference will be our margin as a retailer, if that okay with you. You can exchange it for money at any bank in the Krina Empire. When you put it in your inventory, you can see it's worth. Curiously Seth took the small stone. It was smooth and cool to the touch. When he put it in his inventory, it said Promissory Stone, System Church, 650 gold. Hmm, yeah that is okay. So it's like a credit card? I thought you can just put your money into the system interface. Oh yes, but it's inconvenient to handle hundreds of coins, right? Especially in this kind, he gestured at Seth's culmination of grinding, of transaction. I advise you to make an account, when you cash the money in. Transferring money through the system bank makes many things easier. It was something Simon had not talked about, yet. So Seth kept inquiring. It reminded him of the crystal card system he knew from some novels. When you had an account with the bank you got a universal promissory stone, which could be used to directly transfer money between accounts and get cash from the bank. It was even more versatile than a credit card. And as all transaction worked through the system, there was no need to be afraid of scams from that side. This made Seth realize again, that the priest did not tell him everything, even after joining their faction on the surface. He could not expect any thorough guides from this man and needed to explore by himself. Again, Seth had talked for a long time with the priest and night fell soon. Tomorrow the church would open the pathworks and he would travel to another world. He laid in bed nervously. His eyes were fixed on the pale starlight falling in through the water above, painting patterns on the town outside. Seth went through things he had to do in his preparations, to make sure he had not forgotten anything. His inventory was settled and he would get three sets of clothes tomorrow. Also the other half of jewelry he had not melted down it was in his backpack. Looking for a jeweler to sell them to was also a thing. He had tried to store the whole backpack, but it did not work the same way the first aid kit had worked for some reason. Maybe he could ask the tailor tomorrow? Last, but not least, he had a huge chunk of money. It should be able to solve most things. The highest priority was gaining knowledge. To grow his own skill, but also to find out more about the system. There were so many things he had only come to know because he spent some time in Starta. He had even kept an eye open for a bookshop in town, but had not found one. Another thing he planned to do over there. Amidst his worries and plans, Seth finally fell asleep. The morning reminded him of the alarm clock he had smashed right when everything started. Or rather, it's lack of it. Seth had overslept. The nervousness and worries had kept him awake for too long. Now he belatedly rushed out of the church without any breakfast, to get his clothes in time. The elder lady gave him a professional smile as he rushed into the shop, his clothes in disarray and hairs in a mess. On the counter were three sets of clean and sturdy traveling clothes in the simple style of the empire. He paid forty silver for the three sets and almost left in a hurry. He asked her in a rush about the bag of the first aid kit. She saw he was in a hurry and gave him the short explanation. It worked because the bag was made by a tailor using the system's skills. These bags were not expensive at all and she gave him one as a gift. He shoved his backpack into the bag and was able to store it in his inventory. Now, without any visible baggage, he thanked the tailor lady and ran off. He still came by Claude's shop and took the time to say goodbye. He even said farewell to the old man from the general store, even so it was just because he was in front of his store as Seth sprinted past him. Seth's stamina had tremendously improved thanks to the system, but he was still completely out of breath when he finally reached the church again. He had another hour before they could open the pathworks for him, so he used this time to get ready. He ate a small breakfast, followed by a reinvigorating bath. There was another first for him today. Shaving with a real razor. A knife one, not the electrical ones. Seth was really afraid to cut himself at the start. But the blade actually registered as a miscellaneous item and not a weapon. It's damage values were too low to cut through his physical defense. Even when he slipped with the knife, it did not cut his skin. Freshly shaven and clean, wearing a form-fitting set of traveler's clothes Seth looked quite dapper. He wore a comfortable shirt and dark brown trousers, plus the high boots given to him by the church. Covering these was a long dark tunic in a brown to wine red hue, fastened by a broad belt, where he could attach his sword to. On top of this came a hooded cloak made of oilskin against rain. All in all, 
he looked a lot like the characters in some fantasy movies, or someone from a renaissance festival. They had a big difference to modern clothes, a very high durability for simple cloth. Where his modern shirts and jackets had somewhere between 5 and 30, these clothes easily broke through 100 points in durability. Seth was sure they would hold up for a long time. He opened the big and heavy doors of a room he had not been allowed in before. It was the first and only room that looked like a place of worship. The circular room had the size of a gym and the ceiling was a high dome shape. The walls were covered in all kinds of iconic reliefs and decoration. It was illuminated by a huge number of candles in candle stands. The floor was completely occupied by a tremendously complex magic circle which consisted of gold-colored inlays in the polished hardwood floor on the rim and black marble towards the center. Wrapped in his new attire, Seth entered this big room in the center of the church where he saw Simon, the fairies, and a bunch of priests already waiting. Seth would be leaving first, since his destination within the empire was easier to connect to. The priests started chanting and gesturing similar to sorcerers after he arrived and an ink-black portal formed in the air, like a hole in space. As he wanted to leave, Seth spotted Finn among the fairies. They locked eyes whereupon she avoided hers with a blush. The way they had parted yesterday made the situation a little weird. Still, Seth walked over to the group of fairies. They had not known each other for long, but Seth had taken quite a liking to the little blabbermouth Finn and wanted to say goodbye to her especially, before he left. Finn looked up to him, she could hardly ignore the giant that stepped in front of her nose. Goodbye, little Finn, he could not help but tease her. This made the fairy promptly pout and look away again. There totally was no human in front of her. No. With a wry smile Seth turned around and nodded to Simon as a farewell. It was time for a new journey. Chapter 38 New Horizons Wait. Big fat human. I want to go with Seth. The squeaky shout echoed across the room as Seth was about to step into the portal. Simon had a difficult expression on his face. Minutes earlier. A hushed conversation in high voices as a lot of fairies tried to reason with one of theirs. You can t do that. Yet. Yeah. Now that leader and vice leader are gone, you have to lead us. You saved us. You are a hero. You have to come back with us. The older looking fairy came forward and grabbed the person in question's shoulder. Finn are you sure, his voice was calm and the steady grip of his hand transferred warmth and strength to her. You would be heralded as a hero when you come back. You could leave the core and live an easy life. Do you really wish to go with him? He s my our benefactor. He even brought back our dead. The least we can do is try to help him. Seth is an orihuma, he has never seen a different world and may need our support. You are all hurt and weakened, that s why I will go with him. When you get back the leader and vice leader will recover, so you will be fine, Finn reassured her companions. Among her people she seemed much more mature and serious. The older fairy nodded and gave her a pat on both shoulders. I see, your decision is firm. After this the other fairies also calmed down. She was right, they owed their life to this human. All they could do at the moment was to engrave it into their memories. Present time. The group of fairies stayed silent when Finn rushed over towards the young human and the portal. The priest's expression told them, that their worries might have been more justified than they had anticipated. Seth. Please let Finn come with you, Finn flew in front of his face and requested. A new window popped up for him. Ding. Fairy Finn sent you a party invite. Why slash n? It was the new party function. Would he have been able to see this if he had not unlocked it yet? Seth did not have to ponder long about the decision. He clicked yes. He found Finn quite a der cable and teasing her was fun. And he had almost gone insane in the weeks he had spent forging. It had shown him that even he was hard pressed without social interaction for a long time. There had been times he would have liked some company. Ding. Choose which information you wish to disclose in the party menu. Next, he saw his status and he could choose which parts of his status Finn would be able to see and which he wanted to hide. As much as he came to like her, he only knew her for a few days. He hid everything about his class and skills. He saw no problem in showing his attributes, name, race, or level. He confirmed and... Ding. You have entered a party with Finn Bell Smiter. Ding. You have formed a party with Fair Folk and gained the other's full trust. Luck plus one. Ding. While in a party with Fair Folk, your luck will temporarily increase by ten. Two little windows appeared in the upper corner of his view, which showed his and Finn's health and mana. A typical party interface from MMOs. 
Another window popped up, it was Finn's full status. Name, Finn Belsmiter. Title, Brute of the Fair Folk. Level, 47. EXP, 45%. Race, Fairy. Sex, Female. Age, 204. Class, Battle Cleric, Unique. Affiliation, Fair Folk. Health, 1000 slash 1000. Mana, 820. Strength 117. Dexterity 10. Agility, 90. Intelligence 45. Will Power 35. Endurance 70. Personality, 55. Luck 47. So much for her cute act. What is with this class? And this status? And most of all that title? Not just that, he could also see her skills. Finn had a mix of melee combat skills which focused on hand-to-hand -hand combat like a monk, and support skills consisting of prayer and nature ballads. This small little fairy could most like punch the living daylights out of him, whenever she felt like it. One thing was clear, the chance of her becoming a burden was very small. If Seth did not take care, he might become the damsel in distress that needed saving. On the other side Finn's eyes sparkled, despite not even seeing his class or skills. Just his attributes, level, and title seemed to have mesmerized her. This all took long to describe, but only took mere moments in real time. Just enough time for Simon to collect his thoughts. Ah, Seth. About entering the portal, I have to. Hurry? Okay, okay, I we one tea cost you any more time, Seth calmed the old man down and stepped into the gate. Finn following right behind him, giving the priest a stank eyes. She guessed what the priest had wanted to say. Simon was at a loss as he stared blankly at the gate. Traveling over the pathworks felt similar to dipping into ice-cold water, without the chill. The heart throbbed, the stomach turned and an instinctive state of primal panic washed over him. As fast as the feeling came it was also gone when he left the weird pitch-black in-between world on the other side of the gate. And there was the feeling again. The heart throbbed. The stomach dropped and a primal panic flooded his brain as his foot stepped on air and Seth fell over into a free fall. The infant stage of a scream was already growing in his throat as... Ding! Skill, calm reaction, passive, leave 6 has become calm reaction, passive, leave 7. It got merciless killed by calm reaction leveling up. Followed by a thump, as his 3 meter fall ended face first in a sand dune. Upon which his now calm mind decided on the only logical sequence of actions. He took a deep breath and... Fuck. These fucking pieces of... Seth roared and cursed up a storm of colorful insults while spitting sand like a sand dragon. All trust was lost, all friendship was gone. Simon would eat his fist when he met him again. Finn had naturally started flying with her wings and was now watching Seth spitting sand and flailing around on the ground, trying to stand up and get the sand out of all the nooks and crannies it was stuck in. Before him laid a vast landscape of sand dunes, a desert. Behind him grew a huge mountain range into the sky. He was supposed to be sent to a city called Aura close to a dwarven kingdom on the Nemean continent. Seth had planned traveled around and find or buy ores and items to increase his catalogs. And they had thrown him into a goddamn desert. What stopped him from cursing for another half an hour, was the high-pitched laughter above him. Finn the brutish fairy, was amused by Seth's plethora of vocabulary, and could not help but enjoy the show. Noticing the heavy breathing man, Looking up to her with a twitching eye, she decided to calm him down. Don't worry too much. Finn is with you, she boasted and struck ER flat chest. This is a normal thing the church does to Orihuma. It is the price of your travel, they will put in a random deviation. We are definitely somewhat close to our destination, whether getting there is a struggle or a walk in the park is a matter of luck. Seth was still pissed as his eyes laid on a new world, where the sun slowly sank towards a new horizon. Chapter 39. Dinner and Desert. Starta. Simon, the aged fairy spoke to the priest, you did that thing, where you let luck decide on where exactly the people land, right? He asked. Simon looked as if he was caught doing something. How you treat Orihuma that joined you, is the church's business. I don't care whether you call it a price or divine intervention. If something happens to Finn or Seth and we don't hear from them in the next few weeks, he made a dramatic pause, we, the fair folk, will ask the church for an explanation. Got it. So you better make sure to tell your people over there to look out for them. And this was what Finn had counted on. With her accompanying Seth she could help him, 
run away from her duties and the fair folk would have a much better leverage when talking to the church in this matter. Nemean Desert It took Seth a while to really calm down. He watched the sun touch the desert horizon and turn the landscape into an ocean of crimson red light. Seth sighed and let go of his grieving. Oh, well. Let us eat, he said, and took out a canned soup he could heat up by wrapping his hand in a thin layer of flames. Oh, uh -huh, you used this that night, too. Is Seth a fire mage? Finn gasped and ogled the pale blue flame. Seth looked up from his soup and smiled. Not really, but maybe a little, he said without stopping to eat. After his belly was filled, he felt a lot more relaxed. The sun had vanished and the desert was filled with twilight. The cool breeze of the desert s dawn felt good on his skin. All right, you said we are probably not far off from Aura, right? But how would we get there? Finn scratched her head clueless of what to do. True, it s not like any of us has a map or the map skill, she monologues thinking of a solution. Map, Seth had used the break and started to try and forget its existence. It seemed he would have to keep relying on it. So, he told Finn about it begrudgingly. You have the map skill. That s great. What level do you have it on? she asked enthusiastically. But her face fell when he told her leave too. Do you, maybe, have some SP to level it up? It should be really helpful to us on leave 4. It was Seth's turn to scratch his head. Getting mapped to leave 4 cost 5 SP, was it really worth it? Finn nodded like a bobblehead. On leave 3 you get height map and biomes, even of regions you have not been to. And on leave 4 you get close towns and water sources. Most people I know who have map, get it at least to leave for. It's really helpful at this point, she kept blabbering on. Her ability to monologue was impeccable. Seth shrugged his shoulders, he still had seven skill points and had no plans for other skills right now. At least Finn assured him that it was worth it. Ding. Skill, map leave 2 has become map leave 3. Ding. Skill, map leave 3 has become map leave 4. It was exactly as the little fairy had described. He opened the map window could see the rough makeup of a small continent with a big mountain range extending from the northeastern tip, to a desert on the southeastern coast. The landmass resembled the map Seth had seen back in Starta, so they were at least in the right world. His position was shown at the northern border of the desert, west of the mountains with grassland in between them. Several towns were shown at the foot of the mountain range. In their vicinity was only one town situated close to a river that started in the desert and flowed all the way down to the ocean. He found Aura on the eastern side of the mountains. We would have to cross the mountains to get to Aura. I don't think I have enough supplies for that, the closest town is through the desert. They decided to travel toward the city located at the river and restock on food. Maybe they could find a place in a caravan or something to travel to Aura. Money was not a problem. He regretted selling his snakes a little. Well in the worst case he would have to loot the juvenile. Then he would have a ton of meat, but he rather traveled a few days more, than to do that. Then we should go now. It's better to use the cool night and rest during the day. Finn called out. The night was the darkest right after the sun left, but soon a moon rose to the sky, and then another. Two moons floated across the sky, one excessively big and pale violet, the other much smaller with a green tint. The desert was illuminated in a mix of greenish-blue light, creating a truly otherworldly scene. Beside Seth fluttered the tiny figure of Finn, who had cast a light spell and lit up their surroundings. Seth had donned his armor and sword just in case something crawled through the desert. He imagined all kinds of creatures that could be hidden in the sands of a foreign world. Giant sandworms, gigantic scorpions, snakes. Nothing of that. The desert was covered in a dim twilight and absolute silence. A drowning silence. Say, Finn. Seth attempted to strike up a conversation, but the little fairy did not react. When he looked at her, he saw that her mouth was incessantly moving, but no word was to be heard. Then he noticed it. There was no sound at all no wind, no crunching of sand below his feet. Why did he not notice earlier? He saw the sand moving beyond the shine off the fairy's light. No. No. No 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 no, he kept chanting with his eyes ripped wide open as an old foe rose from the sand. Not tentacles, he screamed and pulled out his sword that was suddenly covered in soul fire. Bathed in the light of the burning blade were black smooth tentacles, shining like polished metal. Finn stopped mid-sentence and looked baffled at the emerged nightmare. Desert Kraken, Corrupted, Leave 25. Status, Corrupted, Starving. 
Croc in. Wait. Seth looked around, at the black limbs that had surrounded them as they emerged from the sand until they were as thick as Seth's waist. He forgot about attacking and hurriedly tried to get out. As big as they were, they were not very agile. As the tentacles closed in to catch them, Seth slashed off one's tip and jumped through the gap. Looking back, he could only watch on with a horrified expression as a giant beak emerged from the ground and the appendages closed around Finn everything in complete silence. He did not know what happened to the fairy, but he decided to use this chance. Burning had been added to the croc and S status and its HP were falling slowly. Soon the bleeding status was added, though he not no idea where it came from. Seth did not care, he was hell-bent on making sure this creepy crawly would regret its very existence. The burning sword kept slashing at the tentacles as tried to untangle and go for Seth. Each slash grew the pale flames that shed their light into the dark desert. All at S appendages were burning and grasping for Seth who kept barely evading the more agile tips. Suddenly everything stopped moving and an ear-shattering, brain-piercing screech broke the silent night. Already suffering a major headache from fire manipulation, Seth could only kneel down and cover his ears. Following the scream was a mushing and crunching sound that made him want to puke. Ding! Desert Croc and Leave 25 has been killed. You have earned experience. The Croc's black bulbous head emerged from the sand and with the ripping sound of gushing entrails a ball of light emerged from its body. Blood covered and with a mighty roar, it asserted its dominance over the desert. Finn, the fairy brood had ripped and teared her way through the Croc's inner workings and into freedom. Holy shit, Seth elaborately and adequately commented this sight. A bloodthirsty roaring fairy floating over the burning corpse of a giant octopus. It would have been the perfect cover for a metal album. Chapter 40 Blood and Sand In a complete blood rage, the tiny figure kept punching the giant body like a jackhammer spreading blood and gore over the desert sand. What battle cleric? She was a berserker. Seth decided to silently take some safety distance until the little whirlwind had come back to its senses. In the end the little fairy was huffing and puffing and drenched in blood. She had calmed down considerably and flew to where Seth was spectating her special time with the tentacle monster. Seth really had not seen enough hentai, to see this one coming. You done, was his only comment when she reached him. She nodded with a refreshed smile and squeezed some blackish thick blood out of her hair. The dead crocken smelled terrible and so did the little fairy, Seth could not help but frown. No matter how desperate they got, he would never eat this thing. He swore in his heart and overcame his disgust to touch one of the half-burned tentacles to loot the beast. He felt the slimy robust skin for a moment, before it appeared in a few neat leather sheets in his inventory. What was left behind were sickening dark grey tendrils of meat still oozing the viscous purplish blood. The headache was killing him and this sight did not make it better. Croc and leather, crafting material, common. Sturdy leather of a corrupted desert crocken. Good for robust leather armor or boots. Let us leave, he said, and left with a fast pace, but the stench seemed to follow him. Oh right, Finn was following him. S-E-T-H you wouldn't have water for me? P-L-E-A-S-E, -E, she asked in a pitifully. She looked and smelled truly miserable. Wasting water was a crime in the desert, but this smell was worse. Seth could feel his sanity decreasing the longer he smelled it. Okay, come here. Finn landed. Seth took out one of his water bottles and started dousing the fairy. She hurriedly started to wash and scrape away the nauseating blood. She still smelled terrible, but it was a lot better now. If he had deodorant with him, he would have showered her in it. And so, they continued their journey, Finn following several meters behind Seth. The two traveled through the night and stopped at the big rock formation Seth had found with Auto Map. When the first rays of the morning sun bathed the sky in a pink hue, Finn claimed that fairies did not need much sleep, so she stood guard. She confidently told Seth to sleep a few hours. Unexpectedly the heat did not bother the blacksmith with his fire resistance, as much as Finn anticipated. He easily slept a full eight hours, all the way past noon. Finn on the other hand started overheating with her tiny body in the boiling air. The little fairy was close to fainting when Seth finally woke up and found her panting and sweating on the ground. She was not able to respond but tenaciously stayed awake. What a good guard you are. Sleep now, he said and picked up the smelly little fairy. He folded a piece of cloth and laid her onto it. She immediately fell asleep. Seth did not doubt her ability, but penetrating the innards of a giant sex, see, sand monster. Probably took a toll on her. The following hours were uneventful. After a satisfying meal, 
came the boredom of looking at the unchanging sand fields his biggest enemy. The hot and dry air felt comfortable on Seth's skin and this gave him an idea. Didn't he everything in the desert normally hide during the day's heat? So, this should be the safest time, right? Seth felt a little bad, that he still avoided the little fairy because of the smell, despite how hard she had worked. He wrapped her in the piece of black cloth and put her into the inner pocket of his cloak. Seth had put away his armor while resting and wore his travel clothes now. As long as he kept his hood up, the sun could not hurt him. With the sleeping fairy stored away, Seth fell into a comfortable pace and started jogging through the desert. It reminded him a lot of his first journey. It was a little harder to run on sand, but his stats had grown, so it made no difference to him. Seth did not know whether his assumption was right or not, but he did not meet a single monster. Puh. Seth heard a tiny voice exclaim and felt something struggling in his pocket. Finn finally managed to unwrap herself and her deep red head out of his pocket. You. Seth. I Finn nearly suffocated in there, she shouted with tears in her eyes. He didn't buy into her cute act, she still smelled of the blood of the monster she brutally slaughtered in front of his eyes. Why are we moving? Wick, she asked and gagged as hot desert air and sand, but most importantly her own smell, suddenly filled her lungs. He explained his ingenious idea to move during the day, since he the heat was no problem, as long as he was shielded from the sun. Finn could rest in his inner pocket during the heat of the day and take over guard, when Seth got tired. He had actually thought, that it would be quite cool to have her on his shoulder, but she still smelled like rotten fish and she would not last long in this sun. Seth estimated the heat to easily reach boiling temperature when the sun stood high. The fairy would be cooked if she stayed outside. It was a boring journey of several days. Fortunately, he had map, otherwise he would have been hopelessly lost. They met some desert snakes and scorpions the side of cats, but nothing like the kraken in their first night. It made Seth suspicious whether it was really random, or the system's god had thrown him there on purpose. Either way, he could not change it now. The beasts they came across were not a big deal for Seth, but they also only gave a pitiful amount of experience. The kraken had actually gotten him 80% of the way to leave 14, despite not being the one killing it in the end. Finn had explained that party settings to him. A party could freely choose how the experience of a jointly killed mob was distributed. As the party leader she had set it to 80 colon 20, so Seth got 80% of the experience of mobs they killed together. Since Finn's level was a lot higher than his, this was actually in his favor in case they killed stronger monsters, like the Kraken. On the third day the desert started to change. The dunes grew flatter and spots of dry dirt peeked out among the sand. Even the temperature steadily lowered little by little. Ruins started to litter the landscape, like the dried-up bones of an ancient civilization. They only appeared on the map after he used auto-map. It was a lot different from Deltan. When Seth had arrived in Deltan, it had become a partly destroyed modern ghost city with all life sucked out of it. This were ruins like you would see them in archaeological documentaries. Built by the bare hand of many people in hard labor. Even in pieces, it still radiated the life and history that had seeped into them during their golden times. They induced a foreign fascination that modern buildings simply lacked. Sanded smooth by the desert winds they still defied time and stood like the desiccated skeleton of gigantic beast in the middle of nowhere. I stared with the outlines of building and shallow broken walls and the further they went, the more was left of the former glory. Sand covered what was once paved roads and intricate mosaic floors. Barely discernible reliefs still covered the ruins of once luxurious facades. How big must this city have been in its heyday, Seth mumbled mesmerized. His fingers wandered over the shallow reliefs of people and beasts and he stopped from time to time to take a closer look. Even Finn had left his pocket to stare amazed at the scenery. Maybe a hundred thousand? Maybe a little more or less, she whispered unwittingly. Which brought her a weird look from Seth. Before they knew it, they had completely entered the ruined city. The sand on the streets was almost gone and the facades on the side had retained much of their glory. Hey, look, Finn suddenly shouted and pointed at the inner yard of a building. There stood a structure that completely differed in style and material from the surrounding ruins. It looked a lot more like the architecture he had witnessed in Strata. The sign dangling above the broken door showed a compass rose and just read Guild. It's a branch office of the Adventurer's Guild, 